No, I, I can't tell if I'm cut off or. I think you're out of the frame, probably, right? Well, I, I think I mean it's just the actual oh. windows, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so chat's here now, which might be a little bit hard to see. That's my so you can read it. Can you guys hear us okay, chat? Your command isn't working. Yes. All right, looks like people can hear us. So we were having technical issues. Sorry about that. Yeah, but welcome everyone. Today we have Mr. Ryan Norbar with me in the flesh. Um, for the, I'm pretty sure a lot of people in chat actually might not. What? Guest is not working. <sighs> Sorry, hold on. Bro. One of my commands is not working apparently. Uh, why is guest not working? Well, while I fix this, do you want to give a short intro? Short uh, intro of for yourself concerning myself. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> sure. Yeah. So I uh, I make at the moment I primarily make aftermarket housings for Topra keyboards. Uh, I've done some uh, Cherry MX compatible keycap sets, uh, keyboard carry bags, uh, and other keyboard meta things. Um, that's pretty much the summary of my my activities in the keyboard world. Um, I have sort of like aesthetic and philosophical leaning behind the stuff that I do, um, but perhaps we can get into that at some point later. <laughs> um, can you tell us some of your previous works that you've done? Yeah, so uh, the first project I ever did was an aftermarket housing for the Nova Touch keyboard. Uh, which I particularly liked because I um, I like the Topra key switch and the feeling and sound of that switch, but um, wanted more creativity in keycap options, uh, particularly because I made a, um, a Star Trek, uh, sort of licensed Star Trek keycap set. Um, and so uh, that keyboard was like the per sort of perfect confluence of the two things that I most wanted, which was cool keycaps and Topra key switches. Um, so I made these, uh, I taught myself how to do machining, which then led to learning how to do CAD software. Um, and I've always been interested in physical making due to other hobbies I've been into, but um, that this, uh, the success of that first project, the, uh, which subsequently was dubbed by the community the Norba Touch, um, the, um, it sort of pushed me to look at doing more keyboard projects just as a sort of interesting creative outlet. You know? mm -hmm. Um, subsequent to that, I did the, uh, this housing which I brought with me, which is the Norba Force um, for the Real Force keyboard, which is my favorite sort of non MX compatible Topra keyboard. Um, and in fact, notwithstanding my fondness for creative keycaps, uh, had always been my daily driver, is the, the Real Force 87U. So I wanted to make a much more interesting housing for it. Uh, so that was what that project was. Uh, also, uh, shocked me with its how popular it was, uh, and I yeah. kept encouraging me to be interested in like, oh, you know, maybe people are interested in what I'm doing, and I should keep keep trudging forward. So uh, one thing that people kept asking me about since I sort of became the aftermarket upgrade Topra guy was, <laughs> can you make a housing for the FC 660C, which is a, a smaller uh, layout keyboard? And that was my first uh, attempt at like. Uh, making hey, a keyboard hey. that was for a key, uh, making a housing for a keyboard that I didn't actually use. Yeah. <laughs> um, so but that it did well. It did, did quite really well, well yeah. shockingly well. Yes. Um, and um, it was also a platform for some creative and technical experimentation for me. Uh, you know, I called it the Heavy Six because I used a uh, stainless steel rear cover plate on it, which made it quite heavy. It changed the acoustic properties. I also went for a much more like. Uh, heavier industrial aesthetic with big chamfers and stuff like that. And so it was, uh, I put a logo on the back because a lot of people asked me to do that. Um, and it, you know, it was just an interesting platform for experimentation. And I learned a lot of things from that, which I then brought to the second iteration of the Norm Force, which is what I'm sort of working on, or I should say, I'm selling right now. Yeah, it's currently live. Um, so if you guys do exclamation guest, this should link you guys to uh, Norbauer's website. We are going to be taking a look at the Normal Force Mark II today. These, this is a production unit, or is this what we? This one is a prototype. Uh, uh, so are there any differences with it, or? This particular one has a slightly different configuration of the rubber feet on okay. the bottom, but otherwise it's essentially identical. 
Okay, yeah, but we're gonna actually build one up today, assemble it together live on stream. Uh, Norbar brought a RGB wheel force that we can put into another housing, a case housing that he brought, so that's what we're gonna do. Yeah, that's one of the distinguishing features of the Mark II version is that it supports the new line of uh, the keyboards force. from Real Force, which yeah. are called the R2s, mm -hmm. uh, and included in that line is a keyboard that effectively replaces the Note Touch. Yeah. Uh, because it is MX compatible. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it doesn't necessarily have identical sort of tactile and acoustic properties to either the Nova Touch or the 87Us. Uh, it is a readily, readily purchasable keyboard that uh, does support MX keycaps. And yeah. so my new housing actually supports all the old 87Us uh, and the new R2s. You just have to pick a breakout PCB based on which keyboard you have. Yeah, which I saw on your website, you have to purchase separately right now. Yes. So don't right. forget that if you guys are purchasing it, you have yeah. to purchase the breakout PCB separately. But I've set up the a first thing that you see on the product page. I've set up a system that will automatically send you a reminder. Email oh really? Okay. If you purchase one. <laughs> okay, that's uh, because cool. when I first started, it, I didn't have that banner quite so prominently. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I think some people didn't notice that. So. Okay. Uh, we actually missed a lot of alerts, so this is what you don't like about Twitch. <laughs> okay. But maybe this is a chance for you to read out some. I don't know. Have you ever read out alerts? Do you want to? Try mimicking what I do. <laughs> uh, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, so for, <laughs> we're here. Any, anytime it says someone resubscribed or subscribed, I usually recognize them. Okay. Well, so, I I'll I'll go ahead and let you do that since you the font is a little that. small <laughs> okay. from my perspective. Here. I will go ahead and do it for a little bit. Okay. Uh, or is it okay, Chad, if I just disregard follows for today, just because we have a guest? Um, yeah, we'll just disregard it actually. For your sake of time, because you also have to. My apologies somewhere. to all of you no, who are going to recognize <laughs> no, the result fine. of my presence here. Yeah, um, I'm clearly a, a naive when it comes to <laughs> Twitch. Uh, my apologies. Yeah, and if you guys ever have any questions um, during the stream, tag me in chat so I can see it, and I'll try to ask Mr. Ryan himself if he if I can see it in time. But I prepped some questions for you, Ryan. That are hopefully different from when I asked you at KeyCon, because I also interviewed you at KeyCon. Um, that was actually a really fun panel. Yeah. That was, yeah. yeah. Apparently we were like the only one that came prepared. All the other panelists, it was just kind of impromptu on the spot. Uh, you're saying I was prepared? Oh, I came, oh, I I came prepared. I came prepared. I totally not prepared. I had questions prepared. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, whoa, what happened? Okay, anyways. Um, yeah, so the first question I have is, uh, how big was the demand for the Mark II that made you want to bring it back? I would have done it regardless of demand. Sorry, you would have done ahead. it regardless. Because yeah. um, aesthetically, at least externally, there isn't that much of a difference. Yeah, that was important. But it me. is a Mark II, which provides new compatibility. Um, so you're saying you would have brought it back regardless of whether there was demand or not. Right. I mean, I just I wanted to make a housing that was compatible with this new line mm -hmm. of real forces because I was okay. excited that they existed in the first place. Because mm -hmm. um, you know, you always get this impression from Topra that it's like this neglected corner of some much larger company and you never know if it's just going to implode and you'll never yeah. be able to buy a new one ever again. Mm -hmm. um, and I was happy to see that they were making this push to a new set of Topra, uh, you know, actuated keyboards. Mm -hmm. And um, it was so, so very, very close to mm -hmm. being compatible with uh, Mark One version that uh, I really wanted to be able to uh, have a version that was compatible with both, just so that I could use them. Again, I want to okay. have some of these keyboards where I can I like actually show off the keycap sets yeah. that I like and the, those that I've made. So I, yeah, I would have done it anyway, but uh, certainly people kept asking for me. And also, I didn't even have to really, you know, I can just look at the what happens when I offer them for sale. Like, I, mm -hmm. I had some extras that, like, I had some parts that Frequently, I'll reclaim anodized parts that are rejects by getting yeah. them powder coated, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and so I uh, occasionally sort of had a little dribble of those available over the past several months, and they would always sell out like within a day or two of my putting them up. So clearly, there was um, a considerable demand for it. I also, uh, once I posted an interest check for this uh, and had votes, I had like 600 people said they wanted it. So, oh wow! <laughs> um, uh, Mr. Bruiser saying, please tell Rand that this community has the utmost appreciation for us meticulous attention to detail. I appreciate that very much. <laughs> yeah. All right, question number two. Um, okay, let's talk, how do you go about re reverse engineering a case? Because that's not something that a lot of people do in the community, I feel like. You're kind of special in the sense that you really like Topra and you don't really have to worry too much about the PCB or plate design. Uh, yeah, I guess plate design. 
Well, I have to worry about it more because it's totally outside of my control. Actually. That's true. But you don't. Okay, that's true. But in terms of coming up with like the numbers for the dimension, is like how do you, do you just prototype a lot, or like how do you? What's the process for reverse engineering a case for something like this? Well, so I think a lot of this comes from my background, uh, learning sort of the rudiments of machining. Mm -hmm. The the um, the first thing you do when you're learning how to machine, whether it's CNC machining or manual machining, if you're really learning it well, is like the first week you just learn how to measure things, right? Okay. Because um, you know, what I do is not necessarily extremely tight tolerance, but uh, machining as a discipline is all about making components for mechanical assemblies, right? Yeah. Uh, where tolerances are very important. Mm -hmm. And um, so you, in order to know whether you've made what you intended to make, you really have to learn how to measure, right? So I learned just like how to use calipers, deal with tolerances, mm -hmm. significant digits, and all that stuff. Um, and the, um, so my process was originally extremely manual. Uh, I just used digital calipers. And it was all done with a calliper? Uh, yeah. Because so I saw you had that fancy tool when I went to your house. Uh, well, yes. So more recently, I've s switched to using a 3D scanner, okay. um, which allows me uh, much more easily. I mean, the plate on a lot of these keyboards is pretty easy to model, mm -hmm. um, but it's less easy to model other features, uh, like uh, little electrical components that might stick out, or the general profile of the keycap region. Yeah. Uh, and by 3D scanning, I'm able to uh, model all of that, import it into my CAD modeling software, and then pretty easily um, basically build around it. Okay. So uh, I like that. I've also, you know, I've been working on uh, uh, an aftermarket housing for the HHKB, uh, and in order to... Wait, is that public? Have you, have you sure. Oh, it is public. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, people ask me about it in forums and stuff, uh -huh. and I'll, I'll happily give an honest answer. I'm not like... Yeah. I'm not going to go so far as to say that I have something that is absolutely <laughs> ready for sale until uh -huh. I know that I, I have achieved a, like a level of um, yeah. quality that I'm satisfied with. Mm -hmm. But you know, I'm quite content to say that I'm working on it. Yeah, yeah. Um, for that one, the the I want to replicate the plate with great precision mm -hmm. um, because I think that if you're going to make a um, an aftermarket housing for the HHKB, you really need to replicate the sort of polymer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. of typing that's what plate. differentiates it from the real form. Right. Uh, it would also be fantastically expensive to mill out all of those tiny features yeah. in uh, in aluminum, especially since, um, based on previous experience of other people who have attempted it, mm -hmm. the acoustic results are disastrous, supposedly. Oh, okay. um, it just like sounds really pingy and awful. Wow. So um, I needed a very accurate model for that plate, which is very complicated. I could never have accomplished that with calipers. Mm -hmm. So uh, in that case, I used uh, an outside service bureau that does um, reverse engineering, and they used an x-ray 3D oh, scanner. Okay. So I have a sort of three-dimensional slice through every you know, oh. aspect of it, including like even the internal threads are 3D modeled uh, in okay. the STL file, which is, is super cool. So there's a service there. that'll scan stuff for you? And there are many such services. Oh, wow, I didn't even know that existed. Yeah. Uh, very, very expensive, okay. uh, especially for the x-ray <laughs> stuff. Uh -huh. But, you know, this is like, in fact, if I make the HHKB case, I'm probably going to call it the heavy grail because it's like the holy grail of, uh, you know, uh, Topra uh -huh. aftermarket projects. Yeah. So um, uh, I was willing to make that huge investment. But for okay. something like Real Force, it would be extreme overkill. Yeah. Um, okay, that's much cool. Money. Yeah. And... Uh, we do have something in s something surprise. I can't speak today. We do have a surprise for you about this HHKB product we're talking about. So stick around until later. We'll show it off eventually. You've totally uh, sort of internalized the I'm a I'm I'm doing a television thing and I want to keep people to watch. Like yeah, that's kind of you have to be like you're teasing enticing for uh, people to stick around for streams. You know, I like I'll have like random giveaways. Sometimes on streams it's all like unannounced. You never know. Just yeah. can't, you can't drop off. That's how you get people to come back. <laughs> um, I respect okay. that. Uh, White Topra. I know you probably... I, I know White Topra, but I'm pretty sure a lot of my viewers... I get new viewers all the time, so... Why did you stick to Topra as your first choice? You mean, why do I personally like it? Yeah, yeah, why do you like it? Boy, that's... I mean... Because you, you haven't done any MX stuff yet. Correct. Although I mean, your normal touch case did fit the cooler master cases. Right. But, right. Um, you're, I know you're a big Topra fan, so for those of you who... I don't show Topra often on my stream because it's not really something custom you can build a lot of times. Unfortunately, yeah. I personally 
have had my fill of Topra. Like I have all the pro most of the products I want, right? Except for like the new releases. So uh, why do you personally like Topra? And so I'll start with a slight digression, which is I was recently having that exact conversation with. Um, you know, uh, I'm very fortunate in what I do that people will just like email me to chat about keyboards all the time. It's one of the oh, great, okay. great side effects. Of, you take the time to respond to all of those? Oh yeah. I mean, oh. sometimes I'm a little slow, but <laughs> okay. I really enjoy. You know, uh, you're very likely to get a very long multi-paragraph. Mm -hmm philosophical reply for me on almost any subject um, but we're talking about the you know there's a slight downside to being into Topra uh, mm -hmm. if you are a member of the enthusiast community because it's kind of like you sort of arrive at this point of keyboards being a solved problem right and I feel like that happened to me pretty early on so when I, when I first discovered Cherry Yomix keyboards it was early on in the the world of uh, like online enthusiasm around keyboards and there were you know, there was basically four switch types that were available. Uh -huh. Looming was barely a thing. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the only mod you could do is you could buy these like little rubber O-rings, you know, which you, you would put under your switches, which is uh, not a particularly satisfying experience. Um, and I got really into and excited about Cherry MX keyboards at the time, and especially keycaps, and um, my mind sort of exploded with the possibilities and I was very excited about it and into it for like six or eight months and then I... Mm -hmm. uh, got a, um, I think it was, it might have been a Nova Touch or it was a real horse, and I was like, oh wait, sorry, I absolutely like very clearly <laughs> prefer this okay. thing. Uh, and But the problem is that the, the ecosystem around Topra stuff, especially before I started doing these things, was like uh, essentially non-existent. Um, There's really very little you could do to modify the keyboard. Uh, yeah. Almost no keycaps um, were available. Like you, you could... Uh, awkwardly source some keycaps from HHKBs, but they didn't exactly line up even yeah. if you wanted to change the colors on your keyboard. Um, and so uh, it's just like, oh, okay, I found this keyboard that clearly feels uh, and sounds uh, exactly like how I want it to, and that's that's just purely, purely an arbitrary aesthetic preference. Or, mm -hmm. you know, like, it's like asking someone why they prefer Earl Grey yeah. tea over peppermint or something. It's just yeah. like, I don't know, I do. <laughs> right? um, and so I, I strongly had that preference, uh, but unfortunately the side effect was, oh, now keyboards become very boring for me because this is just like, this is the answer to my keyboard problems in life. I'm just going to stick with that. Uh, and, you know, I think a part of my motive for wanting to learn how to make more interesting housings and other stuff around uh, keyboards was just like, how can I get back to having an enthusiasm around modding my keyboards and making mm -hmm. them more custom to my preferences? Mm -hmm. um, but the original arrival at that was just, it's just, it's my preference. I still, I mean, if, if Topra were somehow magically deleted from the universe, <laughs> there are MX keyboards that I still very much like and MX yeah. switches, and there, there's been so much evolution in that world lately uh -huh. that um, there's a lot of fun to be had. And in fact, the, my switch of preference, as we were discussing earlier, is uh, Silent Reds that are looped, and uh, those didn't even exist mm -hmm. when I was getting into MX keyboards. So um, it's a much more interesting space nowadays than it was. I think the camera's out of focus. We might need to it come is closer. Out. Why is it so out of focus? Camera, please. There you go. Okay. I think it's the plant back there. <laughs> Are you in focus now? I think so. Okay. Um, so you, for you, Topra is the end game. Do you find no gripes? Because you, now you're making your own custom market housings. What is, is there a next step for you to make Topra even greater for you? I don't have any major complaints with the, oh, like the okay. 87U family. Uh, okay. As I mentioned, I'm not a huge... Um, I won't go say go so far as to say I'm not a huge fan, but I, I do not prefer the sound and uh, feel of the R2 RGB. Yeah, um, a lot of but, people have that. Yeah, right. but I'm willing to make that trade-off to have Cherry MX compatibility. Okay. Um, I'm not sure... Uh, I haven't looked into it closely enough to know exactly what it is that changes mm -hmm. the experience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you oftentimes hear people complaining about uh, people complaining about third-party aftermarket sliders that are yeah. Cherry MX compatible mm -hmm. for the same reason, right? Yeah. Is that uh, it just negatively affects the experience in some ineffable way? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it may just be simply the inherent geometry of the stem, uh, mm -hmm. possibly Which changing, I can do. right? And, okay. and therefore, you can't you can't necessarily have both at the same time. Okay. Uh, the I would be interested in probably maybe playing a little bit more, and I'm sure people who get the Mark II, the Mark II Nova Force, will do this uh, independent of me. But I'd love to play around with uh, ways of changing the internal acoustics of the R2s uh, in my housing because you know I wanted to maintain that sort of vintage 
look of what's described as the forehead here, right? Yeah. It's like old school uh, <laughs> real bezel. force thing. Yeah. Um, but um, but still, like basically bring that to the new R2. And so you have essentially uh, an area of empty space at the top now. Uh, and I wonder if like filling that with foam, yeah, there we go. I wonder if filling it with foam or uh, a dense rubber or something would change the acoustic properties of the R2s in my case. Um, I just haven't experimented with that yet. Okay. So I mean, there's some slight areas of modding, but I don't even like silencing rings or any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. I just, I like the noisy, thocky sound of Cobra. Mm -hmm. What about keycaps with the toper stem, but with your design, like if you have a colorway in mind? Well, that's interesting. Is that something you ever considered doing? I don't know if it's possible, like if well, it you would have be a license on it or whatnot. No, I don't think so. You can't you, <laughs> you can have a copyright on a cylinder that's sliced through. Uh -huh. uh, but the issue is just the cost of injection molding tooling. Right? But, I mean, you have a fairly close relationship with SP now, so... <laughs> well, uh, I know them and I like them, but I don't know that I have sufficient influence to make them invest $100,000 in a new set of stem molds. Uh, because I think this is a question that they've been, you know, perennially, perennially asked since the dawn of the enthusiast community's interest in what they were doing. So um, they're definitely aware that there's some uh, perhaps vocal minority of people who would love to see that available, but... Um, I don't know if Topra's vocal, though. I feel like if someone got like GMK level coloring and legending, but with Topra stems. Well, I would certainly would love to really see that well. exist. Yeah. I would love it. But um, I think, again, the you can never really quite interpret the signals of Topra as a company, mm -hmm. whether they're like, there's a problem that has happened with every housing I've made, which is that as soon as I f get the project ready and start selling it, the thing that it's designed to fit suddenly goes like, is, is discontinued. <laughs> right, so that happened with the Nova Touch. Yeah. Uh, it happened with FC six, 60C, maybe. Like uh -huh. we can't really tell. Like they just all magically went out of stock. They, yeah, uh, they'll probably come back into stock, or maybe, perhaps they have subsequently. Um, uh, and also for a while, the eighty seven U's got pretty scarce, mm -hmm. and I think partly is like the lead up to the R 2s release. So uh, again, I think people are reluctant to make that huge investment in a move towards this very obscure, very expensive Japanese keyboard. Uh, yeah. <laughs> when you know the whole universe supports uh, MX style stems, and it looks like even Topra is slowly moving in the direction of MX support, even That's if that true. comes at the cost of some acoustic qualities that are hard to describe. Yeah, uh, but they're not. They don't give the impression of being a, necessarily a company that's super plugged into the community mm -hmm. anyway. Uh, there are those of us who really love this product, um, yeah. but we it, it feels very one sided. You mm -hmm. know. They have like an Instagram that they posted to like six times, and that was, I think their opportunity. Or, and I think that was actually done by Fujitsu, which is their U.S. marketing mm -hmm. arm here in the I United States. Yeah. They like partnered with Fujitsu to do their U.S. logistics. Mm -hmm. um, but it's as far as I know, it's a totally different company. Okay. All right, next question. Uh, so I know someone was asking this a lot. So let's talk about some of the colorways you offer. How do you come up with the naming scheme for your colors? And how, do you, how did you decide which colors to offer? Uh, I pick ones that I like. Okay, so there are all <laughs> colorways you like. Yeah, yeah, okay. uh, for the most part. Mm -hmm. uh, or if, they're, if they evoke some kind of idea that I find compelling or interesting, right? Okay. So the, um, the aperture finish uh, I came to because it was the closest, uh, it's an almost identical match to a finish that you find on some high-end limited edition Leica cameras. And I thought, uh, and I like right, the right, look of it on those cameras, yeah. uh -huh. and so I wanted to bring something like that to my keyboards, mm -hmm. right? And so in that case, it's it's uh, it's as much about a conceptual link to yeah. uh, those cameras and what, what the finish looks like on them. Um, but in other cases, it's just purely like I'll have a key set in mind that I want to pair it with. Mm -hmm. So like for example, the uh, VHS finish case that I brought and we can yeah. look at later. Uh, specifically, I had in mind um, this like graphic design style you often see in like late 80s, early 90s aesthetics, sometimes described as Memphis or, or, and or Vaporwave, where you'll have a lot of solid pastel colors in the foreground and uh, the sort of like black and white noise pattern in the back that takes different forms. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'm working on this uh, key set, which I call After School 1992, that uh, evokes that these sort of uh, pastel-like colors. Uh, and so that effectively is the foreground. And then I wanted to have a keyboard that had that sort of black and white noise pattern, right? Yeah. So I had a specific pairing in mind, and I know that if uh, it works really well with one 
set that I have that there will be other sets out there that it also will work well with. But I just kind of, I had this very clear vision of, oh, this key set is gonna go perfect with this finish, so I'm just gonna do it whether anyone wants it or not. Um, it's kind of my approach to everything. You know, I, the, there's this other keyboard that you have back here, the Retro Refrigerator oh, finish. Uh, again, I just, I saw it somewhere and I was like, oh, I have, you know, I have to do this <laughs> just because I like it. Um, so I can't, say, I can't say that there's any uh, market research that goes into this or any kind of <laughs> intelligence in that sense. I just, I figure out things that resonate with me and people will either like it or not. And that's pretty much my approach. But like this, this white one, for example, yeah. I think it's called the K2 now. Uh, no, I guess I call it K2, which is... Uh, wasn't it something else in the previous one, the white color? This is the first time I've offered this particular finish. I had a, oh, a, so a glossy a white. Finish. Oh, yeah. okay, I see. I had a glossy white, uh, mm -hmm. which was, I called Space Station White, because it had a sort of right, clean, right. futuristic, space mountain -y look to it. Mm -hmm. uh, this is called, I call it K2, because it refers to, uh, I think it's like, it's a mountain uh, that's just shy of Everest in terms of height and nearby to it, and therefore mm -hmm. covered in snow. Uh, and it's white and has this sort of textured quality. Mm, Sorry, okay. I haven't bothered to put screws in all those holes. <laughs> but, I see. But, um, and so uh, the reason for that, and the reason why this particular finish is uh, less expensive, is that um, so glossy white, glossy white and glossy black are among the hardest finishes to apply um, because any slight irregularity in the the powder coat will be highly exaggerated by the way that light plays off of that smooth surface, mm. and um, so I, I wanted still to offer white, but to offer a version of the color that was more forgiving to apply. Okay. And that didn't have such a high reject rate. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, I found this this really nice uh, textured powder coat. And, it does have uh, a tex slight texture. Yeah. Uh, but that texture really makes all the difference in the world in terms of the reject rate. The reject rate on a finish like this is going to be about zero, um, cool. which is, you know, uh, it can be as high as like 50% mm -hmm. on the, the glossy white. So in the past, I've oftentimes had issues where, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I try to be very particular about what I allow allow to ship um, yeah. with my name on it. So <laughs> I much prefer to just like, uh, even though I hate disappointing people, we'll just say, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to cancel your order because I have a shortfall. Like I didn't get enough of these back from the factory that I'm happy with. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm always looking for ways to uh, eliminate the possibility of that happening in the future. And so this is my way of getting white, but also having it be a little bit more reliable. Okay. Um, and I know you've had your fair share of issues. Uh, <laughs> sure, I've been through so many yeah. factories. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, I think fortunately, whenever people have participated in my group buys, I've done a very good job of shielding them mm -hmm. from the bad experience. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, like actually just getting a case and saying, wow, this is garbage. Um, <laughs> you know, some, occasionally things will slip through uh, and then I always fix it immediately. But um, the, uh, the issues are mostly on my side. They're, they're my, my pain and my experience. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this constant fight with factories for quality. Yeah. For sure, that's uh, has, has definitely been the story which I feel like a lot of people don't fully appreciate about you, whereas like other people, other group by runners who aren't a full fully operating business like you, they'll kind of not put it on the customers, but the customers see more of that. Well, it's very reasonable, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because I, I feel like that's something that people don't realize goes into the process of keyboards. Yeah, I mean, I think that being a independent group by runner, mm -hmm. um, which has you know formed the core of our community for many years, uh, and this to be is like a, a pretty thankless task in many ways, yeah. because uh, there are a lot of people who participate participate in group buys, thinking of those people who are running uh, running them as basically just like a store on the internet, right? Yeah. Um, and therefore, if something arrives that they're not happy with, they expect to be able to send it back and get their money back. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for individual uh, operators who are just doing a thing for the community, uh, you know, essentially at cost, that's uh, that's really tough. I mean, people have lost enormous amounts of money just yeah. because they've been screwed by vendors that don't have any accountability. Especially like if you're in the United States and they're in China and they are not, you know, you're you're sending a you're sending orders to them that constitute a very small percentage of their business, and therefore they're not super scared about losing your repeat business, yeah. right? Um, so yeah, it's very, I, I think I was pretty lucky in my first round by not having it like bankrupt me, you know? <laughs> uh, but I definitely uh, had to learn a lot about, and all of this process, most of the process for me over the past many years has been about figuring out how to 
rein in and control and get the best quality out of partner factories. Yeah. yeah. And so you are still getting them powder coated in the US? They're entirely manufactured in the United States. Oh, even yeah. the manufacturing's in the United States? Even okay. the, the hand assembled, like wow, fancy okay. luxury gift boxes are being made here in LA. I knew that, I knew that, but I thought the I thought at least the machining was done in China. Nope. Wow, okay. Fully made in the US, guys. Fully made in the US. And I saw someone asking, um, what were the reasoning for dropping some of the colorways from, I guess it's the Mark One now, from the Mark II? Uh, in some cases, it's just I found ones that I thought were better uh, in terms of being more interesting or having greater appeal. Mm -hmm. uh, some of it was intentionally just not wanting to repeat myself um, okay. to offer some new creative possibilities. Uh, and also, perhaps implied by the question is why not have all the colors, mm -hmm. uh, both all the ones from last time and new ones, yeah. uh, which is a reasonable question, except that um, skew proliferation is a problem for projects like this. Um, every skew, especially since I have two versions of the housing, there's the standard and the wind keyless version. Mm -hmm. So uh, every additional color I add adds two forms that it can yeah. take, right? And so um, the Whenever you, the more SKUs you have, especially as you get down towards the longer end of the tail, where fewer people are ordering them, it increases the possibility of shortfalls and delays, right? Mm -hmm. Because somebody, um, you know, if I got a few cases, if I didn't have enough uh, white cases back, really, and so this happened in the last round, um, where um, basically it distributes the, the white cases that are good between the wind keyless and the standard version, yeah. right? And so the chances of uh, all of them exactly lining up uh, if I do have any rejects or a significant amount of rejects, uh, means that more people are going to end up being disappointed, mm -hmm. right? Because I can't exactly match what they wanted. Yeah. And so, uh, keeping the number of SKUs low not only makes my like the cost, the operational cost of the project much lower because it's less complicated, but it also means people are less likely to end up not having the thing that they want. Mm -hmm. You know, either come out at all or come out uh, with the first round of shipment because I have to like get some reworked or whatever. Yeah, someone asked that, so... Oh, Dixie just tagged me. Tell Norbar, thanks again for letting me use the name Bauer for my board. <laughs> Very thankful for his kindness. Well, I don't know sure that I was... <laughs> it's a question of, like, me being the gatekeeper of your use of that word. <laughs> I just emailed him because several people were like, Hey, I'm really excited about this new keyboard you're making. Uh -huh. And I'm like, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> I didn't even know Dixie did that. <laughs> yeah, uh, several people <laughs> thought I was behind the, the Bauer keyboard. Oh. Uh, which I guess is kind of understandable, uh -huh. you know, just like... There's like a, a keyboard guy who has a name that's very similar to that. Yeah. Um, and so I, I just sent him a message saying like, <laughs> maybe we could find some way to diminish this confusion a little bit. But um, Just to be clear, so now that you have a Mark II out, is your first version just the Norba Force or is it the Mark I now? Well, I didn't know I was naming, naming two naming's versions. Naming is big nowadays, like with the whole iPhone naming scheme and all that. Oh, like, naming is big now, so... Oh, I think that's a disaster. Like, Is this a Mark I or is this just the Norma Force? It doesn't matter. Absolutely. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. matter. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> in in a conversation where I need to make a distinction between one uh -huh. and the other, uh, I would would refer to one as the Mark I and the Mark II. Okay. But obviously, when I made the first one, I had no idea I was going to make a second one, so mm -hmm. I didn't think to call it the Mark I. That would have been very okay. presumptuous. So, um, <laughs> So, are there aesthetic differences externally that you can differentiate? Assuming we had two, let's say, two retro refrigerator normal forces, are there external differences to differentiate between the well, two? Well, intentionally, in terms of the geometry, no. I wanted to keep. Okay. I really like the shape of this uh, this form. Um, it's very evocative of certain ideas that I like, and it's. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I very much wanted to retain that. The only external difference, especially if you're looking at it from above is uh, I think the powder coating quality will be better. Specifically oh, on a retro refri refrigerator, for example. Better. Yeah, so I'm using- a the second one. <laughs> but, um, I'm using a new process uh, this time around, uh, again, all done here in the United mm -hmm. States, um, which is a kind of, essentially, it's it's like anodizing, but it's a priming coat mm -hmm. for powder coat. So okay. it's, uh, it's I think it might even, it's either like E-coat, you know, which is a some combination between painting and anodizing, yeah. right? Um, and instead of applying paint, they're applying a primer layer. Mm -hmm. And that- uh, Is it similar to like primer for wall painting or? Essentially, okay. yeah. Um, it, basically it's a, an adhesion promoter between okay, the yeah. substrate and the, mm -hmm. the final finish layer. And so um, that adds an enormous amount to the cost, but it also greatly reduces the uh, cosmetic reject rate. And I think just okay. gives more consistent results. Uh, that re retro refrigerator color for all my profound love of it, and for all the love of 
all the people who participated in my group buys for that color mm -hmm. has been a source of enormous problems for me. Um, <laughs> the uh, That's true, because uh, even with the normal touch, mine ended up being canceled, but you sent me out a, I think I was a rejected, one of the rejected ones. Probably, yeah. yeah. Uh, that was especially when I was working very early on with a, a pretty local shop. Mm -hmm. um, and for, you know, again, it's a combination of that particular powder, I don't know why, has this like weird electrical problem that causes adhesion in certain areas to be stronger than in others okay. that we, I, we haven't seen on other powders. Um, but also when there is an inconsistency of that sort, it's much more obvious because mm -hmm. of the glossy finish, right? The way light plays off of it, yeah. um, it anything that isn't pretty flat will stand out, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so our use of that, uh, of this priming process was intentionally for the retro refrigerator to try to get better results on it. Mm -hmm. And excuse me, so far the tests have suggested that it actually works uh, very well. That's and great to hear. So uh, I decided to go with it even notwithstanding yeah. the cost. <laughs> and for those of you guys who don't know, I met Ryan for the first time the three years ago now at the NorCal meetup. It's been quite a while. When you first brought out the retro refrigerator. Oh yeah? Norba Touch. It was a Norba Touch, so the Norba Force wasn't even out then. Okay. Um, it was the one at the, the Nest headquarter. Okay. I think that was 27. Yeah, that was a while ago. Yeah, so that's when I first met Ryan. I saw that and it was, or I saw the Norba Touch in the retro refrigerator and I was, I was just love at first sight. Yeah. I've heard that from many people actually. People who have yeah. subsequently also become close friends of mine. Actually, yeah. my friend Preston <laughs> Chubby's probably uh -huh. uh, He went to a meetup somewhere in yeah. DC maybe mm -hmm. or uh, Boston. And uh, I had sent one of these as a giveaway. Um, oh, right, right. Yeah, yeah, and he was like, he just fell immediately in love with it yeah. for some reason. Uh, and <laughs> like, it's, this it's became the basis color, of our yeah. longstanding friendship. So. Yeah, especially if you're into any kind of vintage stuff, that's like one, one, of, a, one of the classic color palettes. So I appreciate that. That's really nice. It's very close to, for, it's hard to depict photographically in an entirely accurate manner, but uh, it's very close to Tiffany blue. Yeah. Um, for reference, it's sort of, it's a, Sort of desaturated uh, blue green. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I also like the red accent I put on. Totally, it. but it is definitely evocative of this color that was popular in like 1950s, 1960s kitchen appliances. Um, yeah, and that's certainly what it made me think of. <clears throat> and I'm all about the 60s. And... <laughs> that's weird. So you're into vintage stuff. Are you a wind key person or a wind keyless person? Uh, I don't, so I totally appreciate the aesthetic <laughs> drive to have a uh -huh. wind keyless keyboard, uh -huh. but uh, th it reduces the functionality of your keyboard in a way that okay. I'm also like a, a extreme keyboard shortcut jockey mm -hmm. uh, and have lots of custom keyboard shortcuts in all the programs that I use and yeah. they frequently employ the Windows key. So okay, that's fair. Um, I'm not super enthusiastic about letting go of that extra modifier key yeah. that's in such a central location. So personally, I've never used it, but... Uh, <laughs> well, let's say you could reprogram the real force. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, I I also am a big wing key user, but I, with QMK, you can reprogram a lot of keyboards. Sure. So I mean, if I you could there's... reprogram that, would you be a wing key, per, wing keyless person? Uh, I, you could do that, I think. There's this uh -huh. USB to USB... The uh, Hasu... Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and I think you can effectively do that mm -hmm. with, with any keyboard, including Adobe. Yeah. Um, but I just don't necessarily see the need. Uh, okay. I, I get the I get the weirdness and I love the aesthetic, but I'm 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 happy to produce it and let other people consume it <laughs> okay. and just be able to say I I helped uh, realize that aesthetic without having to rewire my brain necessarily. Yeah. This is my same thing about like uh, different layouts. Really, I'm just too. I've been I've been programming and using keyboards and essentially this layout since like basically as long as I can remember, maybe like the third grade, um, and. Uh, I see no particular need to rewire my brain. I don't feel like, you know, a TKL is also actually a little bit of a jump because uh, I kind of miss my numpad a little bit. Um, but that's about as wild as I'm willing to go in terms of rewiring this, this deeply ingrained, okay. you know. Like, I, to me, speed and efficiency when typing is one of the most, like, satisfying things that draw me to the keyboard as a tool, mm -hmm. right? It's very... Um, I really love being good at keyboard shortcuts and all that. Yeah. And uh, anything that sort of slows me down and will force me to relearn a lot of things, I'm not super into unless it has an obvious benefit. Okay. Um, and in this the this case, the benefit is purely aesthetic. And I feel like <laughs> there are other ways to make a keyboard look cool than doing that. So. Okay. But I respect those who do it. 
the next question I had was, can you tell us more about this Veracity Steel, the one thousand three hundred dollar? <laughs> I think it's slightly less than that. One thousand two hundred something. <laughs> I think it was like one thousand two hundred fifty-eight or something like that. It's a high. It's more than your monolith. Right. Well, so, but it, I mean, it's yeah. a huge amount more material. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. So could you tell us a little bit more about what? It's also made in the United States. The other one was made in China. So. The monolith was done in China. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Uh, it was PVD coated here in California, but uh, the okay. machining was done okay. in China. So it's actually remarkable that that's all, all the more more it is. You know mm -hmm. that it isn't more than that. Yeah. Because um, it looks nice on your product page, and I really want it, <laughs> but I have no idea what it is. It's just is it just normal steel with a nice I should, polish? I should, I should have or? brought a sample. Um, it's. So it looks almost identical to chrome, right? Uh -huh. Chrome, yeah. uh, something chrome plated. Uh -huh. um, except rather than being a plating finish that could sort of uh, flake off by time or throw off the mm -hmm. tolerances, it's just, it's simply machined metal that is hand polished to a mirror finish. Okay. Um, and I thought about, so I've, I actually have an aluminum version, um, mm -hmm. which I've used myself, and mm -hmm. uh, aluminum is a much softer metal. Yeah. And, and um, it definitely will get it scratched over time mm -hmm. using it, but I kind of actually like that. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure that, like, you know, micro scratched, not yeah. like deeply scratched. Um, but the, I decided only to offer the steel version because that's a much more conventional material. Um, okay. It's used a lot in, uh, a conventional material by which I mean, uh, it's used in consumer products regularly that see a lot of abrasion and use. Um, so you mentioned watches. watches yeah, so uh, luxury watches use stainless steel almost exclusively yeah. unless they're doing something very exotic, like ceramic or something. Uh, and in fact, not that version of the iPhone you have, but a lot of iPhones have had just polished stainless on the side. My uh, Apple Watch right. has that, right? Uh -huh. uh, I, I think there's probably not a coating on it at all. And this is an advantage in many ways because you can just polish out any light scratches that happen over time. And so it's considered more of a maintainable finish. Okay. Um, and so it's a combination of the fact that, to my astonishment, you know, selling so many of those almost $1,000 monoliths on the last project, um, I, I, I realize there's actually an appetite for super heavy, yeah. super weird <laughs> stuff. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, um, you know, I'm always up for an interesting challenge or a new thing to do. And so uh, rather than PVD coating, like I did last time, mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to try just like, you know, I call it veracity because it's like, it's an honest material. It is what it is. It's not coated. It's nothing else. Uh, you can, if, if something happens to it, you can polish and grind it down. Um, and stainless is obviously the best material to use for that yeah. because it's much more resistant to scratching than aluminum um, and uh, and you can polish it like I said. Yeah, I, f I feel like the community is very interested in stainless steel right now. The number two had a stainless steel version from Keycult that did extremely well and I know of two other keyboards right now that are offering stainless steel variants as well. It's a, it's a very cool material. Uh, mm -hmm. It's very durable. Uh, yeah. It looks beautiful. I mean, the, the main reason I like it uh, for this particular project is that it fits the, the retro futurist aesthetic that I'm into. It's like yeah. super polished, super mm -hmm. sleek, looks super futuristic, uh, has a sort of Star Wars-y quality to it. Yeah. Um, and it reflects the light of the room. And I, I just, I like the look of it. But, um, uh, sorry, you just said something that I was going to respond to. <laughs> when I got slightly sidetracked. Me? What? Yeah, what was it that you had said? Um, right oh, I just, I just asked if you could Oh, tell the community us. is into stainless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I'm like, uh, I totally like the aesthetics of it, and I, obviously there's something to be said for this insanely heavy keyboard, and it does change the acoustics also, but uh, there are non-trivial problems with stainless steel in terms of the cost. Yeah. Right? <laughs> uh, there's the material itself, which uh -huh. is not cheap, again, especially since I'm doing this here in the U.S., but um, the machining is an entirely different enterprise when you're working mm -hmm. with steel in general and stainless yeah. steel in particular. Uh, it's really hard on the tools. And so um, my particular housing, the, this, this profile on the side is, is the somewhat expensive to machine. Also, uh -huh. We get custom end mills made. And those end mills are thousands of dollars that are just <laughs> custom made to sort of cut out that profile. Uh -huh. And you can't use them, you can't use the aluminum one on steel, yeah. right? Um, so. Uh, it's steel is definitely a challenge, um, but I just wanted to try it. And see, yeah, no, I, I think it's, I think it's very cool. <laughs> I really I, want one. It's it's definitely quite beautiful. <laughs> yeah, I should should have brought one. Sorry, but um, I'll I'll try to post some more pictures before the group buy is over okay. of, of the prototype that I have. Yeah. 
Someone asking about titanium, Damascus, or zirconium. Have, are those the materials you've considered? <laughs> can you do Damascus? I'm not sure that you can do Damascus in like a thick billet um, of the sort that you would need to make a an entire keyboard housing out of. You could probably apply a Damascus-like finish to the exterior surfaces, mm -hmm. um, but I'm not sure that that's really quite my aesthetic. I kind of like <laughs> things a little bit cleaner than that, and Damas Damascus is very sort of busy. Yeah. Um, sorry, what was the other question? Titanium? Titanium and zirconium. I, I know nothing about zirconium. Me neither. <laughs> um, um, titanium, but, I know people, some people have made cases out of titanium already, but not, not Topra cases. I can see that. I mean, I. Uh, I've never machined titanium myself. I've mm -hmm. done aluminum and steel. Yeah. Uh, so I don't really know what the considerations are, but uh, I've heard in sort of vague allusions to the fact that it is as or more difficult to machine than stainless uh, among machinist colleagues. Yeah. So um, that's probably a reason why some people don't use it. And I think also the material is probably more expensive too. Yeah. Uh, um, someone asking, are there any other materials you, you are interested in playing around with then? Uh, I've long been interested in Corian, uh, as especially white Corian, but uh, there are, it's difficult to machine in exactly the way that you need to get intricate details for mating it with a keyboard plate. So uh, it's something I keep looking at. Uh, I'm also doing some other non, let's say, keyboard adjacent things in other materials. So uh, I don't love the fact that I don't love a lot of the solutions around risers in keyboard design. And you mean like how? Yeah, so okay, maybe you could share yeah. that one there. Is the, I, yeah. Yeah, my risers are actually quite expensive to machine because they, I've intentionally designed them to have this uh, contour that creates a, a relatively seamless look compared to like the more con the standard conical uh, approach. Uh, but I, I also want to make it possible for people to use the keyboard dead flat because mm -hmm. A, I think that's the most ergonomic approach and it's how I do it myself. Um, and uh, so I want to have the option. Uh, How often do you switch them? Do you actually switch between configurations a lot? No, never. No, I mean, I just use my <laughs> So you flat. just like having the option? No, I mean, for other people. Oh, okay. I mean, I see, there, I see, are, there I see. are people who strongly I prefer yeah, an angle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, I, but I don't like this sort of hack of like bolting on a riser. So my, uh, I've been, I spent about a year working on this project of different types of desk mats mm -hmm. where you actually have a keyboard that is inherently flat and can be used flat if that's how you want it. Or if you want to impart an angle to your keyboard, you'll use a, a, a mat that is effectively a riser, but that looks much nicer oh, okay. than these bolted on risers. So uh, I've gotten them machined out of uh, nice walnut wood, uh, and I've also gotten some that are covered in leather. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm pretty happy with the results of those. So uh, another thing we could talk about if you want is I'm working on a Cherry MX keyboard. Um, and uh, when that comes out, I think I might not offer risers, but I'll simply sell these mats. Uh, and the advantage to those is you can, um, I'll probably have them in different angles so people mm -hmm. can choose what they want. And I just think it looks a lot nicer on a desk mm -hmm. uh, than these sort of bolted on afterthought kind of things. So for stuff, because I know a lot of people also do something like comb feet. Right. Is it cheaper to manufacture the riser as a separate thing or is it cheaper? I'm guessing the reason why you went with this option is because it's cheaper and more feasible. Like, well, let's say no. you offered a case with just an integrated angle. I, for better or worse, I'm not always known for doing <laughs> things that are cheaper and more feasible. Uh, in this case, uh -huh. I did it because I wanted to be able to have it, to be able to use it flat mm -hmm. if, for those people who wanted that, and also to have a riser with minimal aesthetic ugliness. Okay. Uh, right? Uh, and so I did, it, I did the conical risers on the Norba Touch, yeah. um, and that was definitely much cheaper to do. These, uh, those risers cost pro like easily 30 times as much as the mm -hmm. conical risers. I think um, they look a lot nicer. I think they look a lot nicer. I'm not a big right? fan of cone feet. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, and so th that's why I did it in that case. Um, uh, but you know, again, this is some, some amount of like selfish motive here. So uh, I, I, I use the Norba, uh, Norba Force, and so I wanted to be able to use it dead flat. Uh -huh. However, I don't use the FC660C. Yeah. So I figured, whatever, I'll, I'll try making one with an inherent angle since uh -huh. I think there's probably a stronger community preference for that. Yeah. Um, and so that, that went okay. Uh, I think well, it went well. People seem to qu quite like it, but I just don't use it because I can't. <laughs> it's not flat. Um, and the HHKB, I'll probably also have an inherent angle rather than risers. Mm -hmm. But um, whenever I do a TKL, 
simply because I'm going to use it. I want to be able to have a flat version. Uh, but also to offer an option to people that is maybe, in terms of giving it an angle, that's maybe aesthetically superior to other options that have been out there. Of course, like, you know, as the trade off with a lot of the stuff that I do, it'll be expensive. Yeah. <laughs> what are you going to do? Yeah. All right. Uh, just a couple more. Sure. How hard was it to preserve the backwards compatibility? Because I've, I've never actually opened up a Real Force Round 2 yet. Okay. So was it, was it very different? Was it? Uh, it wasn't too bad. Mm -hmm. um, the, the maddening thing was, it's almost as if there were like the people at Topra were trolling me or something because <laughs> the uh, the plate is almost identical uh -huh. and the uh, electrical configuration is almost identical, but it's uh -huh. just enough different to require fundamentally re-engineering the interior of the case. Okay. Um, and so I had to go through many prototypes to hit a sweet spot that is compatible with both. Because particularly there's these two, um, if you remember from your 87U assembly, there's these two notches at the bottom of the plate. They're kind of like, like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they have a further round notch in them yeah. that the screw goes into. Those same notches exist on the R2s. They're just like ever so slightly differently <laughs> located. Uh -huh. um, and so I had to find a way to uh, position the screws in a location that was kind of a compromise between those. Okay. Uh, and so I use washer. If you install the R2 into an Orbiforce Mark II, uh, you need to use washers that slightly expand the diameter of the mm -hmm. screw yeah. uh, and cinch that plate into place. And I had to move ever so slightly the screw positioning for the 87U, so it won't necessarily look like exactly lined up with those holes, but it still works perfectly. Okay. Uh, and so I, I just had to, through experimentation and some amount of pain, just uh, find the, the perfect sweet spot that was compatible yeah. with both of them. The problem with the electronics is that, uh, again, if, since you've done the 87U, you'll know that there's a, there's a four c conductor connector yeah, um, and then you plugs, have to also ground it. Right, but there's a, a fifth ground wire, uh, which screws into the plate and also yeah. screws into my breakout PCB. Uh -huh. On the R2s, for whatever reason, they've decided to build that fifth conductor into the connector. I mean, it's a little bit nicer, but it's yeah. such a it's a it's a tiny change, but one that for me requires a totally different breakout PCB. Okay. Um, so I had to essentially remake two new breakout PCBs uh, to be cross compatible. Oh, so you need a different breakout PCB depending on whether you're getting a round one or a round two, or no? Uh, w well, it's a little bit confusing. So uh, <laughs> the terminology here, let's be clear. There's what I call the 87U family and uh -huh. the R2 family. Okay. okay. Those are the two families of keyboards that you can buy from Realforce. Yes. 87U being the older type, yes. R2 being the new type. Uh -huh. And then there's also the Mark I of my housing and the Mark II of my housing. Yes. Okay. So uh, using that terminology, can you re-ask your question? <laughs> So for the Mark II, are there, do you have to purchase a different breakout PCB yes. depending on whether you're putting an 87U Got it. around to you? Okay, yes. The answer to that question okay. is yes. Uh, some people just uh, are buying both because they want to be able to have the flexibility down the road. Mm -hmm. um, but the correct way is figure out which kind of real force keyboard you have yeah. and make sure you buy the breakout PCB that is compatible specifically with that one because they don't work with each other. Okay. Did you guys get that chat? <laughs> Can you use the breakout PCB from the Mark I? No. You can't? Okay. No. Got it. I see. All right. Hopefully that made sense to chat. And uh, we can have a flame war discussion about USB-C versus... Uh, that's what I was going to ask next like. after, actually. Because um, if, if you guys saw my Keycon uh, designer panel, I asked... Nor Norbauer made a comment saying that he hates USB-C. He doesn't know why keyboards need USB-C. Uh, that may be slightly overstated. <laughs> Can uh, you talk about that decision? Did you even think about offering USB-C at all? Because uh, the Mark I is USB-C. I devoted a few moments of thought uh -huh. to it, uh, simply be for continuity between the two of them. Yeah. I already made C. So I uh, spoke to the um, uh, electrical engineering firm that I'm working with that's helping me make these PCBs, because mm -hmm. I don't... My uh, electrical engineering expertise is highly minimal. Uh, minimal. And so um, I said, can we... Um, my, the, round, the Mark I had a USB-C connector because mm -hmm. people really wanted me to have that connector form factor. Uh, but 
the it didn't have a built-in uh, what is sometimes described electronically as like a, a USB-C hub. Again, I don't fully understand the technical implications of it. But um, one downstream effect was that uh, you could use it with the cables that I shipped the keyboard with, which is to say a USB-C on one end and a normal old school type A USB connector on the other end. That worked just fine. Um, but you couldn't actually use it with a cable that had USB-C on both ends. Mm -hmm. uh, that was not a scenario that I tested for. Mm -hmm. I just kind of assumed that it would work, but I, you know, USB-C is sufficiently new that I don't really understand it. It's yeah. also kind of complicated because uh, USB-C is a connector standard, mm -hmm. but there, there's also the like the protocol of what goes over the wires of that yeah. connector, and there are different standards for that, yeah. uh, and it's still kind of an evolving thing, um, at least as far as I understand it. So I said, well, can we, uh, can we support these new two different keyboards, but maintain uh, USB-C and add the proper functionality to uh, to support USB-C on both ends. Uh, and the answer to that was, uh, A, I'm, I don't think we can fit the circuitry into the space that's required given the tiny footprint that I have to stick the PCB into, at least on the 87U. There's much more room with the R2, but um, I have to have, use something that's sort of similar between the two of them. Yeah. Um, and so uh, even if we could fit it in there, it would cost you know many thousands of dollars. And... Uh, I, I simply don't make enough money doing this to justify <laughs> doing that. Uh, and uh, I would contemplate it if there were any reason whatsoever to have USB-C. Uh, and it's clear to me that uh, because I've had so much pushback on this, I know that if there were a really compelling argument for why USB-C absolutely must exist on these keyboards, and if it doesn't exist, it's a huge travesty, I would have heard the argument. But I haven't heard one yet, uh -huh. uh, other than the fact that it's like it's the hot new thing. Right, it's just like uh, it's regarded as being the, the latest thing, and uh, there there's this beautiful vision that someday all keyboards will only have USB-C connectors, um, but which a I'm kind of in favor of and would love to see that happen, but I don't think it'll happen for a very long time. And given how many peripherals exist out there already, um, I don't think that uh, Type A connectors are going to disappear anytime soon, mm -hmm. um, or at least some way of achieving compatibility. And in fact. You can buy a, a cable that has USB mini on one end and USB C on the other, problem solved. That's um, true. So there's all of that, plus there's the fact that mini is kind of a de facto standard in the hobbyist world. Right? There's all these uh, nice aftermarket coiled cables that are out there. You can get some uh, in C nowadays, but uh, they cost a lot more and a lot of vendors just don't support it. Yeah. So uh, if anything, there are reasons not to do it. I think mini is actually a pretty robust connector. Mm -hmm. I feel like C pulls out pretty easily. Um, so. I, I remain open to adding C on other future projects, but I I also am waiting to hear like a super compelling argument for why it's absolutely necessary. Yeah, and you also mentioned you're a fan of B, right? USB B. Uh, B. What is B? That's using this is a B connection right there. Uh, I thought you said that at the key conference. Uh, yes, yeah, someone else in the panel was oh, saying okay. that they preferred uh, Mini B. Oh, okay. Mini B. Okay. Yes, that's right. C is way more robust, 0-1 C board, mini USB. Someone's saying mini USB is more durable than USB-C as well. Okay, I could see that. I feel like for the enthusiast community, it doesn't matter. You're gonna matter. have to like, maybe maybe that magical argument is in these com comments somewhere. I apologize, <laughs> I haven't been reading them all, yeah. but I will <laughs> review it. Or post in the Cube Talk thread for the Norbiforce Mark II. Mm -hmm. um, or I don't know, actually make a different thread because we've already <laughs> thread crapped that enough with USB-C flame war, but uh, I'm overstating it. it's not flame war. Uh, uh, okay, and then just one final question. Um, you are incorporating the steel backplate as correct. the default Oh yeah, I guess option, that, right? That's so, something we didn't talk about. It's one of the other yeah. uh, point, one of the distinguishing features of mm -hmm. the Mark II is that it has a steel backplate. What, because that obviously adds more to the cost, the most of the Mark II. Quite a lot, yeah. Um, I noticed the retro refrigerator cost more because of that. I'm guessing that incorporating that steel backplate adds to the cost. What made you decide that versus just sticking with this and then just offering the plate as an add-on option? Uh, people seem to like it so much on the Heavy okay. Six, and it was standard on the Heavy Six. Oh. So, okay. uh, and you know, whenever again, it's best to avoid skew proliferation yeah. for many reasons. Uh, but in this case, it's a question of negotiating with the vendor, right? If they have to make two different kinds of things, yeah. then. Um, the cost of each of those is going to be higher on a per unit basis. Mm -hmm. So I feel like might as well simply choose the thing that's better and try to negotiate at the higher volume a lower price so that everybody gets it. Mm 
um, I don't see any obvious uh, downsides to the steel option. Yeah, because um, I, I mean, I saw it when you were selling it. You sent out an email once saying you were just selling the back plate. I considered it, and I was like, uh. <laughs> well, so I, I did, people kept asking me uh -huh. um, for PVD coated stainless steel back plates that were compatible with okay. the Mark I uh -huh. uh, ever since I offered the Mark I in the beginning. And in fact, someone in the community um, started a group buy for it, but he didn't manage to, to oh, finish Oh, I didn't even it. know that. Okay. Yeah, that's because I sent him the design, and I said, sure, absolutely go for it. Uh -huh. um, you know, I don't even have to give me any money or anything, just do it, because people were asking. Um, but for whatever reason, uh, I think, you know, life happened in his case, and he's, he encouraged me to pick the project back up. People kept asking, so I um, did make aftermarket upgrade rear cover plates available that were PVD coated. It took me a really long time to find a vendor that could reliably produce the results I was looking for, mm -hmm. um, but I did, and so uh, those plates were offered as a group buy as an upgrade to people who had the Mark I, but mm -hmm. wanted to have a heavier steel back plate, yeah. and also specifically wanted the PVD finish. There are people who really want that. Mm -hmm. uh, I offered a, a matte black, and yeah. also a brushed gold version. And the brushed gold version is pretty bling, actually. It's kind of, uh, kind of <laughs> cool, uh, having seen the samples of it. Um, because I didn't think it would actually, I thought it would be a little gauche, but I actually like it in practice. It's, it's almost sort of brass-like, uh -huh. uh, and uh, those, that project is almost done, that group is about ready to ship. I think I probably have a few extras in stock. You could technically use it with the, the Mark II, but since the Mark II has a steel plate, it's not a stainless steel plate, unless you like, very specifically wanted PVD, or one of those people who are just like really into PVD, <laughs> I'm not sure that it would necessarily be worth, worth the trouble. Okay. They're, they're quite expensive. Yeah, no, that, that's, I mean, I, I want it, but at the time I was like, I should, I should be disciplined. <laughs> Very understandable. Um, are you gonna get, oh, that's a personal question. Yes, I know I have Echo in my room. I just haven't gotten around to uh, treating my room yet, but that is a top priority right now. All right, shall we get to actually showing off the Mark II? Oh, sure. But well, before that, I think people want to see the, uh, the HHKB Thing we're talking about. Oh, yeah. If you want to. There's some big leaks, guys. <laughs> so, this is a, a prototype, uh, let's say, let's call it a pre production sample. Um, we're farther along than prototyping. Um, this was going to be, I knew from the beginning that this would be a considerable technical challenge. Um, and my main concern was, particularly, the, there are these, for anyone who's ever taken an HHKV apart, you know that there are these little clips here. Um, see that. Yeah. Nathan has these really cool foot pedals that allow him to switch cameras, <laughs> and they're actually huge chair, or actually, what are they, kale switches or whatever? It's the, the big box switches. Keys, uh, big switches, yeah. Yeah, so you guys can't, <laughs> can't appreciate how cool this is. Um, so there are these little clips here that hold a bent wire that uh -huh. are effectively a stabilizer for the, uh, for the keys that go well, here. Well, the, the real forces have it too. Um, do they? Yeah. Well, for yeah, that's right. For the yeah, stabilizers. Yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, it's a different sort of plate, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and so these... These create an undercut because uh, there's no you way I'm going to be able to undercut? show it on the camera, but the geometry is like, if you look at it from the side, it's like sort of, I don't know, it forms a P shape if you were to look at it from the side. And so um, that means that uh, in order to, that's why the holes are there. Oh, it's really bright. This white, sorry. You can yeah, no worries. Yeah, so if you flip it over um, on the top here, you can see that there are, there are like, and these are present on the uh, actual HHKB itself. There are two holes, right? And the reason that those are there is because of that undercut. So the, um, the metal injection molding tooling will have these moving parts that slide into those holes to, uh, to, to create the undercut. And so that makes uh, molding a part like this extremely expensive. Like I, I think that whoever it was that came up with this design for Topra must have been making money off of how expensive the mold cost them because it's just like the most insanely unnecessarily complicated injection molding part ever. Um, but uh, so there are all these technical challenges that I needed to solve around figuring out how to get this part um, replicated and, and fabricated at any price that could conceivably be uh, workable. Uh, and we've managed to solve all of those problems. Uh, the, the stabilizer clips do actually clip in there. They do work. Um, I should have brought some sliders with me to sort of demonstrate. Uh, th this plate is a, a functional drop-in replacement for the HHKB's native plate. Totally works. The only problem is there was some miscommunication with the, the molding company. They applied a kind of uh, primer to, in 
increase the cosmetic properties or improve the cosmetic properties of the, the master. And that imparted a, a roughish texture to the surface. And it creates this sort of scratchy quality when, you're, uh, when the slider is moving up and down inside of the slider housing. Uh, and so they're currently re remastering the part for me. Uh, I have uh, prototypes that do have a smoother finish and the, uh, they feel entirely right to me. So, and there's no reason to think that we can't replicate that feel in the mold. We just have to get, get them to properly texture the, the master. And so that's where I am right now. Um, I'm, I've made a few changes, like the, the, these screw holes were kind of a, a naive design and I've, so I've made it a little bit more elegant. Um, but essentially, when you get my housing, you will, uh, you'll take apart your HHKB, you'll take the domes and the springs and the sliders all out of it, and you'll pop them into my plate. The plate will then be affixed to uh, a metal housing. And so this is my way of achieving um, the aim of having a really nice aftermarket metal housing for it, but still having the flex and acoustic and tactile properties of a polymer plate. Uh, and I've been working on this for an extremely long time because yeah. I get like, you know, five emails a day for like <laughs> HHKB win. And um, someone asking, is this going to be, are you going to be making just a plate or also a full-fledged Norbauer HHKB case? Oh yeah, the whole thing. Yeah, of course. The whole thing. He's going to make a Norbauer HHKB case. This is just merely one component of the end product. And then uh, I saw Quantric ask, why did you stick with the original stabilizer design like why did you did you ever consider redesigning it so it's easier on yourself um i could have done that so there was someone made a prototype version of the uh of an hhkb case that was machined out of aluminum that someone posted on geek hack a long time ago and i think yeah i've seen uh, that it's a very uh, famous sport if you're into yeah if you were around that yeah so i mean the, the again i never experienced it but the complaint was that the uh metal nature of the plate created this very undesirable pingy quality. So I knew that that was probably gonna be a dead end. But um, if you had made it in that manner, there are other ways that you could like put screws into the plate to avoid needing to create those clips. Because again, uh, with a machining process, there's no way you could replicate that overhang unless you essentially created multiple parts that you glued together or screwed together. Mm -hmm. um, but in my case, I'm using a somewhat more forgiving molding technique that actually does allow slight overhangs. And uh, I figured I might as well just replicate exactly how the original plate is, uh, since I can do it physically. It took a little bit of, I, I, I had to find a company that can do this type of urethane vacuum casting that actually like really understands technical requirements. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that wasn't super easy. I tried quite a few places. And, um, uh, but once I, f I found this vendor that could, could do it, I was quite happy to just retain that feature and you know, might as well if you can. It's much yeah, easier I mean, to assemble. It's great that you're preserve, trying to preserve the polymer plate feel as much as possible because... Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's an ABS-like urethane. So it's as close as you can get um, mm -hmm. without having an injection molded part. Because like the plate is one of the biggest differentiating factors between the HHKB and the real force. So yeah, absolutely. I feel like putting an aluminum plate kind of defeats the purpose of it, or a metal plate. Um, someone asking is Norbauer, Norbauer is Ryan's full-time job? I suppose so. Yeah, you can think of it that way. That doesn't mean that uh, doesn't mean that it makes me a particularly significant amount of money. Uh, in fact, I'm still, you know, I'm kind of, uh, I'm intentionally or semi-intentionally just kind of treading water in terms of profit for these projects, just seeing if there's some way that I could turn it into a sustainable business um, by, you know, exploring what what the possibilities are um, for meeting these types of community desires and you know to what extent it is creatively satisfying for me and like what the trade-off is between those it's enormously creatively satisfying and there seems to be quite an appetite for what i'm doing so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very encouraged but it's still not like uh anything I, anyone re would reasonably consider a full-time job um i kind of like uh how shall i put this I, i'm sort of at liberty to not have to worry too much about that and so um that's not really uh that's not my principal motive. Yeah. Um, so I actually took my HHKV and this, uh, the Norba Touch to KeyCon, not KeyCon, TwitchCon. Um, so I think people really liked the aesthetic of the, Nor the Norba Force case, especially in this configuration. But when it come, came to typing feel, a lot of 
people there actually prefer the HHKB over the real force. I can see that. Yeah. yeah. So that was interesting to see. And then I told them afterwards, oh, you can just get this on Amazon. They were shocked. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I don't necessarily have that preference. I prefer uh -huh. the metal plate uh, real force keyboards. Mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, you know, I, I'm probably a little bit biased because I don't really love the HHKB layout. Again, because I'm just too lazy to rewire my brain. Yeah. But I do, I understand why there are people who have that preference. It's mm -hmm. just, uh, it's again, it's a somewhat arbitrary aesthetic preference yeah. uh, of what you what you want. I'm fortunate that the, the typing experience that I prefer happens to exist in the form factor <laughs> that I prefer. Yeah. But uh, I know there are a lot of people who like this sort of like softer, more cushioned, dampened feel of the HHKB. Um, someone asking, what material and or process do you use for early prototyping? Uh, aluminum is the sort of standard uh, prototyping uh, material, 6061 uh, CNC machining. Uh, unless it's something pretty small. So like for example, the uh, I made uh, Norbaforce keychains, uh, and in that case I actually just 3D printed them. I have a Form 2 3D printer, uh, and I 3D printed the masters, uh, was happy with the, the geometry of them. I then scaled them up for casting and actually sent the my physical prototypes to the factory that was doing the metal casting, to, which they actually used as the masters for casting. So for smaller stuff, um, the Form 2 works. And in fact, I've actually done some prototyping of the Norbiforce Mark 1. I prototyped on my Form 2 before I sent it out to get a machined aluminum part. Um, but the, You have a 3D printed Mark 2. That's right. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> but, so this was before the, so, Formlabs has come out with a much larger 3D printer now, uh -huh. but back then, the, you know, the, the Form 2 can print a cube about, about yay big. Yeah, uh -huh. um, so I obviously can never print a full uh, Norbiforce Mark II, or Mark 1, so what I did uh -huh. is I created this like keying system. <laughs> so I would print it in six parts, and then I would slot them together. Oh man. You know, kind of like dovetail uh -huh. uh, joints. That would be a cool picture if you ever released it. Just I it do have like. it somewhere, actually, okay, still. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I actually might have posted it on I don't Instagram. Think I ever... I'm not sure. Um, there's some 3D printing stuff there, okay. but um, it, it was good enough to, to get an initial sense that I was sort of roughly hitting hitting the mark in terms of lining up with the plate screw locations. But uh, because of that keying system, it really does throw off the tolerances a little mm -hmm. bit, especially as you get over like the, the full length of the case. Yeah. Uh, and so I would never have had confidence to just use that as a prototyping mechanism. So okay. uh, after that, I'll send it out to be made by a prototyping shop in aluminum because mm -hmm. then you can actually trust that the um, mm -hmm. you know because uh, prototyping shops in aluminum will have a stated tolerance mm -hmm. and as long as that's within something that you know that will work for you then you're pretty pretty safe um something that just came to mind so i mean you've, you've had your fair share of running pro, uh, group buys now at what point do you decide i'm going to at what stage of prototyping do you decide i'm going to sell this product like, did you fully prototype the Mark II and have it flushed out before oh, yeah. putting up your product page? Or? I mean, I go farther than that. I get a full pre-production run done, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I'll tell people, hey, I'm working mm -hmm. on it, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I'm in no way willing to commit to doing a project unless mm -hmm. I have gotten uh, sa pre-production samples, which is different than I'm a prototype, from the factory that I, th I would be happy to ship to a customer and ready okay. to sell in all of the finishes that I'm likely to get it in. Uh, it doesn't mean that you're, you know, there's this whole concept of a golden sample from a factory, which is they, they, they will always give you, like, for your sample, the most idealized version yeah. because they know that it could lose them the deal. So it's not it's not perfect, but it's way better than just, like, blindly sending an order to a Ooh. factory, Ooh. right? Um, and I want to see it in every single finish. So, that, okay. again, it's all it's all about risk reduction, right? And yeah. what, are, what are the probability that somebody who participates in one of my group buys is going to end up uh, with their order cancel and yeah. trying to keep that number as close to zero or at zero as possible. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, they're actually two separate separate phases. There's prototyping, and I get that done by a different shop that's like has their tooling and prices specialized for that type of work, uh, and then the production work, which is like a totally separate thing. Oh, okay. So you get your prototypes made not from the same factory that actually does the production. Okay, that's interesting because I I feel I know a lot of people don't do that because. They're worried the prototype and the production might be completely different products. Well, that's why I add a, this extra step that I think a lot of people don't do, which is called a pre-production run in right, right. like you know okay. standard industrial yeah. parlance. 
um, which is kind of like a prototyping run. But the thing is, uh, when you're working with a shop that primarily does production work, mm -hmm. they're usually not interested in doing prototyping yeah, that's work, true. right? Just a one-off. And but they will will do a few for you if you're committing to a larger order, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so uh, you know that's that's what I'm calling a pre-production run, okay. uh, pre-production samples. Okay. Yeah, because I know a lot of independent group by runners. Some even have their group by page and sale alive before they even have a physical prototype in their sure. hands. So it's a little scary. So it's nice to see Norbar, who's a professional, have the full <laughs> prototyping done before actually releasing a product page. I, I, I mean, you're <laughs> perhaps giving me too much credit to call it uh, being a professional. I think it's risk aversion, perhaps, uh -huh. um, and just not wanting things to blow up. Uh -huh. <laughs> Um, so, so a lot of people asking about any details on the MX board you could possibly, you don't have to if you don't want to, sure. but if you um, want to share. Uh, yeah, what do you want to know? Uh, I think <laughs> someone asking, someone asking uh, what layout it's going to be in. TKL, of course. TKL, okay. Yeah, uh, at least for the initial one. Um, so there's some things that I'm interested in doing with this board. Like I want to be able to uh, offer something that is of value and of interest to the enthusiast community, mm -hmm. but also to create something that's accessible to someone who is interested in buying a really fancy keyboard, but not interested in investing the huge amount of DIY work that's required to put together a yeah. kit. Uh -huh. um, and so I, I want to create something that can kind of appeal to both of those groups so that I can kind of uh, push against uh, and probe this potential market of people who um, who come to me frequently and say, oh, hey, I want to buy your thing, but yeah. uh, are daunted by the actual work that's involved and the waiting that's involved and all mm -hmm. that. So, um, you know, I'm probably, I've been looking at different, you know, mounting methods and materials and there will definitely be some kind of uh, vibration isolation or vibration slash acoustic isolation uh, between the plate and the housing. Um, and I, I've come up with some interesting materials and like strategies for doing that that mm -hmm. I think are interesting. Maybe I won't talk about them yet because I'm going to actually <laughs> conduct tests on them next week and I don't yeah. want to get people excited and then disappoint them if I decide I don't like it. Um, <laughs> you can also try out some of the stuff I have later off stream, but yeah. Sure, yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in this whole like, I was actually very skeptical of the whole uh, gasket yeah. mounting yeah. trend for a while, <laughs> just because I'm inherently skeptical of all trends. Um, but I was uh, uh, at the house of my friend, Japanese horror writer who we were discussing recently, yeah. uh, uh -huh. and he had some uh, essentially identical keyboards, one of which were, had a gasket mount and one of which didn't. Okay. Uh, and I was able to type on them side by side and actually noticed quite a striking difference between mm -hmm. them. Um, I'm, it's not entirely clear to me. Uh, you know, I'm with Zach on this, as we talked about at the KeyCon uh, yeah. thing, which is like, I think there's not a lot of science around any of this, and it's yeah. kind of a little <laughs> bit subjective. I would love objective ways to measure it. So I think, like, in some ways, the effect may simply be acoustic. Like, it just changes the sound, mm -hmm. and that maybe also changes your perception of what the feel, feel of typing. Okay. Um, but it's also, I mean, physically quite conceivable that it is dampening the vibration in some way that is mm -hmm. satisfying. Um, but So I, it's a, a bit of a mystery to me why I like it, but I actually did like the gasket mounted version, which got me... Okay. I mean, this is the whole reason why I'm interested in making MX stuff in the first place. In addition to trying to make something that's easier, that doesn't require someone to buy another keyboard and assemble it together, yeah. it has all these interesting extra creative possibilities because mm -hmm. I can actually design the plate geometry. Yeah. The, um, I'm, I've been greatly limited in all of these Topra projects. It's always like a bunch of trade-offs and constraints where I'm working around the geometry of the existing plates or yeah. the weirdness of the PCB and stuff like that. And it really limits what I can do. Um, if I have control over the PCB, I have control over the plate and all of the geometry and materials around all of that, I can experiment and do more interesting things. Definitely. Um, so that's part of it is like, I'm interested in doing you know plates and different materials um, and particularly having like regularly in stock keyboards that people could purchase where the finish specifically pairs with a key set, mm -hmm. right? So in the, in the way that I have this, like this concept that I like of the pairing between the, uh, the after school 1992 key set and the VHS finish on my Norbert Force Mark II, um, you, you will have to sort of get things to line up right to purchase all the things that you need to build to do that build. Uh, ideally, ultimately, over time, I want to have like a key set that I design and that I have more or less in stock, and a housing finish that is specifically designed to pair with that. And you can just like say, look at the picture of that build and say, I like that build, I want it, mm -hmm. right, and then order it. And in that case, the only choice you would need to make is switch mechanism. Mm -hmm. And um, this is another interesting area for me uh, that I've been exploring and experimenting with lately, which is um, some means of providing lubed switches to customers um, when they 
uh, when they receive their assembled keyboard. Mm -hmm. uh, and this actually came from a conversation we had at Keycon in New yeah. York, which is that like really, especially you know, um, if you're gonna make a keyboard that you're representing that as being um, embodying the best that a nice keyboard can offer, uh, you really should have some level of lubrication in the switch. So, um, and stems. Yes, of course, absolutely. I mean, actually, I'm more convinced of that than anything else. The mm -hmm. like switch uh, stable, stabilizer rattling is, since I've uh, become aware of it, it, it like deeply <laughs> you can't irritates me. It, yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, and that one is actually pretty easy to do manually. So, um, but manually lubing every switch uh, mm -hmm. before it goes to the customers is feasible. I can mm -hmm. do that. My, um, you know, I work with a logistics company that currently ships my stuff that is they're more than just like uh, a company like Easy Post, which is just like you send a bunch of stuff and they have a really sure. automated system to send mm -hmm. it out. Uh, the company that I work with is kind of like what, what I would describe as last mile manufacturing, mm -hmm. uh, which is that they will do assembly or other work that it, they'll even like solder things, right? Mm -hmm. um, on demand before the product ships to the customer. So uh, I could technically actually train them to lube switches by hand. <laughs> <laughs> um, which would be expensive, but it, again, it would allow people to get like the ultimate keyboard without a huge amount of work. Uh -huh. um, and so uh, that's I have that option in my back pocket, but I'm also looking at some kind of automated like robotic mechanism for lubric lubricating switches in a like it won't be done in, in necessarily the extremely meticulous manner that you have of like uh, where like every conceivable surface is brushed. but like I think at some level at least, uh, properly and consistently lubricating the rails, mm -hmm. uh, like for example on a yeah. on a red switch, yeah. profoundly changes the experience of Definitely using that, that switch, yeah. uh -huh. uh, and is like probably an eighty percent uh, achievement of like positive lubing results. Yeah. And so I'm trying to figure out some way, some sort of sweet spot between um, uh, acceptable price and actually getting really good switches uh, mm -hmm. as they arrive to you. So uh, again. It probably, for people who are kind of like following my email list or my work, it probably has seemed that I've just like dropped off the face of the universe for the past, <laughs> past four or five months. But it's not because I've been idle, it's because I've been working on all these things. Like I'm building a switch lubricating robot and an HHKB plate with 3D x ray scans and all this stuff. So I'm working on stuff, I promise. Um, Someone's so. actually saying he can help you set up some robots to lube switches. I would, I would love anyone with experience in industrial automation. I've been, we've been working on it a little bit and I have some some ideas and I've been learning about these processes, but um, uh, this is definitely not my area of expertise. That, that would be cool if if the problem of lubing gets solved. Right. I mean, it would kind of put me out of business, <laughs> but at least switch, well, I, that'd be I really don't be have so to tragic, worry maybe. about switching, right. lubing switches anymore. Yeah, it's, yeah. A very, it's a pretty tedious process. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the way that you do it um, is cl clearly superior, I think, uh -huh. uh, for someone who is very sensitive to this, the slightest changes in like someone who would know the difference between different like grades of lube or something, right? Mm -hmm. I'm personally not that sensitive and I feel like most people probably aren't. Mm -hmm. um, they're like, there's this general perception of like scratchiness or not that most yeah. people could probably tell. Um, like beyond a certain point, you're like really picking hairs. Right, and I, I, there, should, there will always be a market for that and there yeah. should be a market for that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it would be nice to find some way to bring uh, this, this, process that clearly greatly enhances the Cherry MX switch using yeah. experience to a wider group of people. Mm -hmm. cool. so that's one of my many projects yeah. at the moment. All right. Well, I think it's time to bring out the Mark II. Sure. And we're going to assemble one as well, right? Let me put this back. And then question, yeah. are you also going to keep the same packaging for the Mark II? Or are we going to see some new, no, it's more a new, of our packaging? It's, it'll be new packaging, but Ooh. more similar actually uh, to what shipped on the Heavy 6. I'm trying to... I did not purchase it, so I don't know. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I have this, uh, I have a new logo that's highly inspired by like mid-century California sign aesthetics. And so I okay. incorporated that into the packaging along with my like, quirky love of uh, the color pink. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's kind of a weird... Uh, it's a weird packaging design that I quite like. And so uh, it will ship in that. I'm currently debating, so you'll recall, perhaps, if I remembered to include it in what I sent to you, 
uh, that the uh, Mark One had a kind of insert in it, which had an individually numbered card. Yes. And I signed uh -huh. it and had uh -huh. some artwork on it. Um, I'm thinking of doing maybe some different version of that, um, where not only like will I sign it, but also the person who inspected it and packed it will sign it, and maybe even the machinist. And so we have this like full uh, direct connection between the people who made the thing and the those who are consuming it. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what I'm looking at, like what what kind of cool thing I could include. But I'll, I will leave it as a surprise with the actual form that it takes. Okay. Uh, and assuming I don't run out of time and just ship it as it is. Because yeah, I possible. mean, you are one of the designers I praise for packaging. <laughs> I feel like packaging, you don't need it, but I feel, uh, I think, I feel like you do need it. <laughs> it's like something that a lot of people don't pay attention to. But I mean, also a lot of people don't have the means to. Like if you're just yeah, one person running a single group by, like you're probably not going to care about the packaging. But for someone sure. who's trying to, make so I mean, business. I'm happy to say that the uh, the boxes, one of the boxes for these is uh, around twenty dollars, mm -hmm. just to get the custom EVA foam milled and the hand assembled packaging and everything. Okay. It's a very it, it adds non trivially to the cost of the part, mm -hmm. but it has uh, a number of advantages. One of which is that it heavily insulates the part from any assault that may occur to the box in mm -hmm. transit. Uh, and I, I don't think I've ever had a keyboard that shipped in one of my EVA foam line boxes that was ever damaged in transit. Yeah. Uh, sometimes the, the exterior of the box may get a little uh, crushed or something if the, mm -hmm. uh, if the corrugated box is like really smashed. Mm -hmm. But the keyboard is almost always fine. Okay. I think it is always fine. Um, and so there's that practical part to it as well. But as we talked about at Keycon, my like truly principal motive for doing all of these things is to just like evoke emotions in people who are like into the same aesthetic things that I am. And so I feel like having a nice unboxing experience is very important to that. It's just like part yeah. of the whole way the that you first thing you encounter when you purchase a luxury item. Like yes. This. And I personally appreciate that a lot in things that I buy from other vendors mm -hmm. and you know wanted to take a go take a go at it, but yeah. it's a it's definitely an expensive process and also the, the ne negotiation with these packaging vendors always for me, and I think people in a similar position to me, is uh, minimum order quantity. Mm -hmm. They don't like making 100 or even 500 of something, right? Uh, because there's a lot of setup work that goes into it. And yeah. so for me, the greatest challenge has always been finding factories that have really good quality, have a price that isn't insane, and um, actually are willing to make them at the quantities that I want. Like, mm -hmm. I've got, I got quotes for packaging for this. They were up to like 60 or $70 per box. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, and the that obviously is not going to work. I don't even know what product exists out there for which that would work. Uh -huh. uh, maybe like uh, an Hermes scarf or something. <laughs> All right. So I can already see the washers you were talking about. Yeah. So basically, the, the parts that will be required for the assembly of your uh, Norba Force will come in that piece extra PCB kit that you order. Mm -hmm. And so, because we know based on the uh, PCB kit that you order what type of keyboard you have, we will include the appropriate parts that correspond to that. So the R2 PCB kit will include those washers, and the 87U will not include those washers simply to avoid confusion. Okay. Um, and I'll show you where those go when you assemble it. And so what you guys are seeing here, this is the VHS finish. It looks really nice. In case it's not obvious, it's because it's like the static that, you know. Yep, <laughs> like the static you see. VHS tape, yeah. yeah. Hopefully it's clear why it's called VHS. I'm, I'm not that old, but I, I know VHS. <laughs> but I, I feel like a lot of my viewers might not know VHS. <laughs> That's okay, I'm glad to bring my ancient <laughs> wisdom to a younger generation. Okay, let me push this just out of the way. Uh, I'm just gonna put the, can I put the feet on here? I might put them on last, actually. Last, okay. Yeah. So we would need to start by taking this apart. Sure, yeah, you could take that apart or you could take that apart. Um, okay, I'll take the case apart while you take the keyboard apart. Okay, sure, give me the hard part. Because <laughs> um, I've actually never opened this up, so. Okay. Uh, it's, it can be a challenge depending on how much you care about destroying the plastic housing on your uh, real force. Since you're taking it out of the plastic housing to presumably permanently put it in this other one, it really doesn't matter very much. Mm -hmm. But um, but I presume for the round two, it's a bit more intrusive, right? 
It is actually a little bit because the the eighty seven U is super easy to pop out. Yeah, it just has could. these little tabs and it's hinged. Yeah. Uh, this one you really have to pry it a little bit more. I brought okay. a um, I have these rubber feet all over everything. Um, I brought a spludger. Uh, which spludger. Is a familiar concept. But I don't know what a spludger like, is. S P U D G E R. Turn for it. I'm not sure where it is, but I'm I'm probably going to include a spludger in the kit. The okay. PCB kits, because it just—it's a plastic, basically a plastic wedge that you can use to pry open the housing. And because it's plastic, unlike a normal screwdriver, it's less likely to damage the um, the plastic of the housing that you're opening. Oh, it looks like a lot of my chat actually knows what a splinter is. Splinter, yeah, there we go. A little pry tool—that's quite correct. They're used in uh, like people who do iPhone repairs uh -huh. a lot. Do you plan on making a? video for how to disassemble this and then put it into your... Yeah, so there's already a video for the 87U, um, and I will make a similar one for the R2. Okay. <laughs> or maybe I'll just point people to uh, your video. And well, I've never actually taken a part of R2. Right. Well, I just mean this video we're making right now. Oh! <laughs> but yeah, I'll probably That's make true. a That's more true. polished one. Yeah, this is the part where I would normally use the spudger. You can like, you can pop this part out pretty easily just with your fingers, but mm -hmm. there are little yeah, hooks tabs. here that go in. Yeah, they're tabs that go into a negative area, so I'll try to do it with my fingernails, but oh, I, I personally don't ever care about mashing my plastic housings to death, because yeah, I mean, once I'm not going to use them. The point is to get rid of them. Bare screws if you uh, lost one. So. up the plastic a little bit here just because I'm using a metal screw but or a metal screwdriver but uh, plastic splutter is much better. Also don't care. Um, have you dropped PayPal as a form of payment? I don't think I've nope. sent out a newsletter for that. Are you aware of the changes for PayPal? Um, I think they now charge you to do refunds. Yes. Yeah, uh, I haven't dropped that of other people. Uh -huh. uh, but isn't it this? Is that different than normal credit cards? I, I, the I sort of skimmed the sure. email from PayPal, uh -huh. and it seemed to suggest uh, something which I was not aware of, uh, which is that a normal credit card processor also does that. They you don't get the fee back if you process a refund. Mm. Um, I was. I actually thought you did get it back if you ran a refund, but um, my information is maybe a little bit out of date, so they could have changed that. Um, but you know, a lot of uh, a huge portion of people check out using PayPal. Mm -hmm. I think part of partly it's convenience, but if you know, sixty to seventy percent of people are checking out on my store using PayPal, I feel like I should probably not get rid of it. Mm -hmm. It's not clearly not the case that those people would not buy what I'm selling. Uh, mm -hmm. If PayPal weren't offered, but maybe it's true for some percentage of people. Um, I, the only thing that it makes a little bit awkward is when someone, and this isn't really PayPal's fault, it's Shopify's fault, is if someone orders a VHS finish and they decide, oh no, wait, I want to like upgrade to the steel version. Yeah. Um, the the sort of standard way of doing that in Shopify is to cancel the original order and place a new one. They don't really have, they don't currently have an order editing functionality built into the their store. Uh -huh. um, and so in that case, you're going to be double paying the processing fees, which mm. sucks. So um, I might, aside from encouraging people to make up their mind when they <laughs> pl place the original order, uh, I might have to do some like partial orders where instead of canceling the original order, I sort of apply the payment to the second one or something. Okay. It makes the accounting much more complicated, but then at least you don't have to pay the fee twice. So. It's interesting to hear that that's been an issue in the community. Yeah, because um, a couple of the vendors have already 
drops support for PayPal. Hmm. Well, maybe if enough people do that, PayPal will change the policy. Um, so yeah, the, I've, I've pried apart the two halves of the plastic housing, and then you have the cable, which uh, is not normally detachable, um, that runs through the plastic housing, and there's this little um, Molex-style connector here, and you just pull it out. Yeah. And then you have this liberated plate. Now, another issue with the R2, uh, which is perhaps worthy of consideration, is that the, uh, some of the R2s, maybe all of them, have this cutout here that has LEDs. Okay. I personally really never want to see LEDs when I'm using my keyboard, and in fact, my keyboard effectively uh, blocks them. Yeah, that's but true. you might get a little bit of light leak depending on um, which one you have. So I think you can use the keyboard just fine without seeing the LEDs. There's sort of like visual confirmation of what you've done. Um, but you could I, just apply like electrical tape. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. Okay. I, have, I, have, I have white electrical tape at home, and uh, what I would what I do is just apply some right there so okay. that you don't get light leak, but nice. uh, even if you don't do that, it's not really yeah. particularly bad. Um, so, so there, there you go. go. Just plop. Like this. Correct. Yes. So, I mean, another, if you're kind of interested of a tour of the internal geometry of the real force, the, uh, oddly, the 87U, so in order to add rigidity to the plates, the uh, Topra will create these bends along the edge. Oh, I see it. Right? Uh -huh. Yeah, and so that just it makes it more rigid. The directionality of the bend is reversed from the 87U and the R2. So oh. I have this channel that that lives in for the 87U, but on oh. the R2s, I had to add another channel down here, which is actually ah, a little bit tough to machine because it creates this really thin wall. It's actually, yeah, it is pretty thin, actually. Let me show that yeah. off. So those are the channels Norbauer is talking about. There's one on the bottom here. And one on the top here. So yeah, it's just it's like the people at Topra were messing with me for no reason. But yeah. Whatever. Um, so yeah. Um, someone also asked me a question on a previous stream. Mm -hmm. uh, when you powder coat, do you get hook marks? Because it's quite common when you anodize. But so you shouldn't get hook marks. Period. Uh, this has for been a great powder coat or in general. Uh, in general, okay. um, certainly not for powder coat, but you shouldn't get them for anodizing either. This has been a point of great contention for me with anodizers, uh, specifically the ones that I used to work with in China. Mm -hmm. uh, I would ask them if there was some way that they could make custom work holding, to um, so that, so that the clips didn't contact cosmetic surfaces. Um, for whatever reason, they would claim that it's just like impossible against the mm -hmm. laws of physics. They were not right, however. Um, I recently got a batch of Norba Touches, which I actually have in stock in my store. It's like a random surprise batch of black <laughs> anodized ones. Um, I have a few of them because I, I just did this test working with an anodizer in California. Okay. And they were like, yeah, sure, absolutely we can do that. We just need custom titanium screws because uh, you can't use steel screws because those get... Um, corroded during the anodizing process. Mm -hmm. But if you use titanium, they can use that because it's electrically conductive and then they can put their clips into that and the part mm -hmm. is fine. Uh, so those of you who are working with anodizers, don't let them tell you that there's it's an unavoidable problem. Uh -huh. um, you, you just might need some custom tooling and to pay for that. But it can absolutely be avoided. With powder coating, uh, they always, almost always just use screws. So as long as your housing has some type of threaded holes, which I don't think I've ever seen a housing that didn't, mm -hmm. um, uh, they should. Whoever's doing your finishing shouldn't have an excuse for that. All right, there you go. Because I mean, we see anodizing hooks, hook marks quite a bit. So. Yeah, it's it's quite common. All right, so I can already tell the hole is slightly off from the actual screw mark. So yeah, exactly. That's where so, the washers come into play. So for the both uh, 87U and R2, these holes are actually positioned in the correct location, in the same location. That's the but bottom one. the R2 is a little bit. Uh, shorter and offset, which is why you need the washers. Yeah, so there you can see the ones on the sides are pretty flush, but the two bottom ones are ever so slightly off. Yeah, and so you only need the washers here on these two front areas that have the cutouts for those tabs. You don't need the washers on the sides. Okay. I'll probably include extras, but and, and actually there's no harm, I think, in putting the washers on the sides, but don't need And we trouble. can do all this cable stuff afterwards, or? Um, we need to do it first. Yeah, for this one you can actually do it after. Nice. For the 87U it's a little bit more fiddly. Can I get a big, the bigger one? Yeah, 2.5. Someone asking, do you own, what boards do you own outside of Topra? 
or your own actually uh yeah so i have some some old philco cherry mx red keyboards that were my first keyboards which i had and loved they were the magis touch ninja tkl that was definitely my favorite keyboard back in the early days um and uh, outside of topra i think that's that's pretty much it I definitely experienced a lot of Cherry MX keyboards going to meetups and talking to people lately, getting feedback about what they would want and expect from an MX keyboard, but I don't actually own too many. How many top reports do you own though? Well, I mean, <laughs> I have you, last probably time 20. I <laughs> Over 20? <laughs> Nowadays. <laughs> I don't know, maybe, because I've also been looking at doing a housing for the 980C. I have the, I might want to do a housing that matches the Norma Force for the numpad. Um, oh wow, you're even considering the numpad. Yeah, um, and then I have, um, yeah, I just got the 3D scan done for the numpad. Um, I have a number of real forces and all the different weird permutations and configurations, both because I wanted to take interesting pictures and have show a variety of keycaps and layouts, um, but also just because I needed to test uh, what worked with the Norma Force. Uh, also, I don't know, sorry if I already just said this, but uh, I'm working on a 980C case mm -hmm. as well. Um, and so I just got one of those. So I have a growing pile. Yeah, I mean, I've been to... I think I've seen your office twice now. Ooh, my office is much better now. I can't wait for you to visit it again. Better in terms of furnishing or...? <laughs> uh, furnishing for the most part. Okay. So making products like this, uh -huh. industrial design in general, uh, involves lots of tiny little parts and mm -hmm. components and prototypes and so I used to just have a bunch of like clear plastic bins that I bought from a kitchen supply company mm -hmm. and I just have all my projects spread out everywhere in bins based on things that were conceptually related but that makes for a very cluttered and ugly office mm -hmm. so I just ordered a bunch of uh, filing cabinets from England from a company called Bisley okay. um, that makes just like um, shallow drawered cabinets that ha may have like 16 drawers so it's really perfect for me so I can have a uh, like all my screws in different sizes in their own separate drawers. And I'm, I'm so happy about it. I just took delivery of it right before I left. So this is the breakout PC and you can see Ryan's logo. Pretty cool. So do you recommend plugging the cable in and then screwing it on? That's or? probably easier, yeah. All right, and the ends don't matter, right? It's reversible. That's correct. All right. Here we have the USB mini. And so the only important thing to remember there is that the uh, USB mini connector is facing down. Uh, there are no screws for this. Oh, okay. No screws in my bag. Yeah, so you, the USB connector should be facing down. Um, someone asked me, outside of keyboards, what are some other areas where Norbar appreciates quality? He knows you use a Mont Blanc pen. <laughs> That's true. I, <laughs> I've loved Mont Blanc pens since I was a kid. Um, probably like fifth grade or something, I got one from, I think it was owned by my grandfather. Actually, it was a very old 1960s uh, Mont Blanc fountain pen. And so I always had this sort of weird obsession with Mont Blanc pens. Um, other areas of quality. So I, I'm very interested in this company called Hermes, which makes leather products, um, <laughs> and more like not necessarily as a vast consumer of their products because they are, if anything is prohibitively expensive in the universe, it is products made by this company. But um, I, I find the like approach to craftsmanship and the philosophy of the business very interesting. Uh, and I've watched a lot of documentaries and read as much as I can about how they go about their business. Um, and I think it's really cool. I actually took a little course in leather working just because I was kind of interested in the type of work that they, they do, learning how to do it. Um, other areas of quality. Yeah. Replicas? I well, I mean, work with replicas. yeah, I mean, there's this whole separate uh, 
former business of mine, um, which is uh, replicas of props that appeared in Star Trek um, that, you know, one of the primary motives for me aesthetically in life in general is an interest in the past's um, fantasies about the future. And uh, Star Trek is, for me, the, the perfect example of this uh, very optimistic vision of the future that um, existed in the past. And I feel like as a culture, globally, and particularly in the United States, we've lost some of that optimism and a clear view of what the future would look like. And so, um, a lot of the aesthetics that I'm drawn to in keyboards are what I describe as retro-futurist, and also uh, it's why I was drawn to Star Trek props um, and made like uh, I made for this company called Roddenberry. Um, Gene Roddenberry is the creator of Star Trek. I made these uh, really high-end, extremely accurate replicas of props that appeared in Star Trek for people who, like me, grew up on the show and all of the sort of starry-eyed ideas for the future that it embodied, um, and the world of Star Trek prop replica people is just like the keyboard world. We are insanely obsessed with detail and craftsmanship and quality. And uh, I, I think in, in many ways, the, far exceeding the keyboard world in terms of obsession. Um, and uh, uh, I've been involved in that world for a long time too. Um, it, it's like down to the level of even recreating flaws that existed in the original mm. props, right? So. Uh, some people will make idealized versions, but if like if the original had a battery that was sawed in half and just like really or like d drops of glue inside the prop that you couldn't even see on screen, <laughs> people want to get the drops of glue in exactly the right positions as the original 1960s yeah. prop, which was like long ago thrown in the garbage. You know, yeah. um, and I find that interesting. I, I like anybody who has extreme obsession or one that connects to some emotional resonance for them or is an escape from everyday life. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I guess that's, you could think of that as a kind of quality. <laughs> um, someone mentioned that the connector looks too short, but there's, there's a fair amount for you to play around with. So um, I didn't have any trouble putting it in and I think there's enough. Looks too short. I feel like it's maybe a little bit too long. There's enough extra length for you to like, comfortably place it in. Yeah. I mean, you don't want to have the cable bunching up too much in there. I mean, as long as you fold it over here, it's fine. Yeah, I think this is a good length. Yeah. There isn't a huge amount of clearance between the plate and mm. these electrical components, but as long as you ensure that your wires are flush with or lower than the tops of these screws, you'll be able to get the plate on. And I just want to say this is a much easier experience than the Mark one. Yeah, it's very that that the fifth Mark conductor <laughs> is very fiddly. I thought I I because I read your manual sheet and I thought I could do it, but I actually fiddled around with it on stream when I assemble it because totally uh, yeah the, the best thing like underneath and everything yeah the the sheet illustration is just kind of like cutesy and for fun <laughs> best to watch the video because yeah. the video shows the video in helpful. three dimensions how it works yeah, yeah. Um, the other thing that's a little bit of a challenge in this install is uh, I recommend not fully tightening down these screws oh, okay. um, because you'll want to probably it depends on how OCD you are align it is align it, yeah. And in that case, you really want the keycaps installed. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe before you put the plate on, we'll put the keycaps on and yeah, just we can see that. how it lines up. Yeah, the chat doesn't know we have this ready. Oh, yeah. But, yeah. once again, Norbar already has a pre-production sample. Uh, yeah, so this key set is called After School 1992. Uh, I don't have a page for it anywhere other than on Keep Talk, uh, but there is an interest check. check. Yeah, and so you can, like, if you're interested, you can vote in the survey thing I put at the top of it. But this is very late 80s, early 90s, slightly vaguely vaporwave uh, themed. And again, it kind of connects to this like period of future optimism and modernist aesthetics that I'm always drawn to. So I'm actually pretty excited about this set because it's so weird. <laughs> and you said this is DSS profile. Correct. So this is actually my first time trying out DSS. Yeah, I think it may be one of the first sets that's offered other than the ones that Signature Plastics made themselves because they did a DSS Dolch, which I think you can actually buy on their store now, um, which is nice. I have that set. I, I ordered it before I committed to using DSS Profile for this, um, but uh, I don't think there are a lot of DSS sets out there yet. Mm, yeah, there are. I tell you. Uh, Mr. Petrov saying, as someone whose last year of school was 1992. This just became a must-buy. 
Yeah, I, I actually had no idea Ryan was bringing this because I thought it was a render on your. I thought it was a render on your product page. People often think that my photos are renders, which is I think a great compliment to my uh, is, yeah. <laughs> photo retouching and editing skills. But uh, but I just no. I just had no idea you had the full kit in hand because yep. I I know the interest check. Like I said, I don't want to commit to do it because <laughs> the 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 I, I did a mock up in Illustrator uh -huh. and it didn't. I mean, it looked good, but it wasn't nearly as amazing as I think the actual physical set is. Um, and so I, um, I really wanted to get a physical set first before I could commit to saying that I actually, that it was going to look like what I had in mind. Um, I think that's one of the nice things about, this is being done through SP, right? Correct. Yeah. Cause I don't think, or actually, I don't know. I don't know if ever, someone's ever asked GMK if they can get a full production set, but they'll send you like sample colors. Sure. And that's totally, totally good. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's better than nothing. Yeah, but especially for the set, which I was like not. Again, I had a vision in my mind based on the signature plastics color ring samples, mm -hmm. uh, and I couldn't, for the life of me, get my Illustrator mock-up to look like what my vision was. Mm -hmm. um, but the actual implementation was exactly like what I had in mind, and I w would definitely not have taken money from people um, on the promise of it turning out good, not knowing that it absolutely would. A, a frequent problem with key set group buys when you're just um, sort of going off of samples is the visibility of the legends in the surrounding color field, right? Um, and sometimes it's not it's it's not easy to just based on the coloring samples guess whether a color is going to show up against like yeah. if this yellow would show up against the purple, or like particularly I was worried about the uh, this uh, pinkish Pink, color against the what's effectively retro refrigerator. Um, but uh, some sam getting before I even did the full sample set, I got some individual key samples and it was clear that some of my original choices were just not gonna work. Okay. So uh, I highly recommend to key set designers to spend the extra time and money if, you, if you're worried about getting that kind of thing right. Yeah, but I mean, as far as legending goes, uh, it seems like pretty standard SP stuff. Uh, very nice legending in my opinion. I think I can complain about so far. The colors look really nice. My camera probably, it's not properly calibrated. But in person it looks really nice. So do you, are you satisfied with this production or are you gonna go for a second round of samples? Oh no, I'm very happy with it actually. It's just, it was exactly what I had in mind. Um, I was extremely happy when I opened the box <laughs> and it arrived and it was, it was in some ways better than what I was envisioning, which is Ooh. great. And these are all actually stock signature plastic colors. These are stock colors. colors? Yep. Oh, I didn't even know that. It took some level of creativity combining them to get something that would work out. But um, um, the, uh, you know, Pantone matching is, um, it's a pain. It's a pain, and I think uh, it raises your MOQ requirements. So uh, right, yeah. I wanted to, if at all possible, because I had no idea whether anyone, you know, this is a sort of quirky set. Um, there seems to be some considerable enthusiasm for it now that I have the sample, but I had no idea before I did it whether anyone would be interested at all. So I didn't want to commit to doing a set that would end up having a really high MOQ because that had a bunch of custom mm. uh, mixed Pantone colors. Yeah. How often do you take keycaps off and put it on? Uh, I've been doing it a lot more lately because I've been shooting all the product shots for the Norbu Force. Um, but in terms of my own personal use, almost never. Does this have a profile? I'm going to guess it's like this. Eh, it looks right. I think so. I think that row may actually be... Just... Oh no, the front is slightly higher, I think. It's a very interesting profile because it has this like sort of scooped mm -hmm. quality to it. Um, Which, I mean, you mentioned earlier this doesn't have, but you can actually get what's called row five. Mm. So it actually adds that downwards oh, okay. for the bottom row. But it's not common. Um, I think people are starting to request that with GMK and GMK, more GMK sets are incorporating that, but 
uh, for the most part, they're not all that common still. And there's even a row zero where it scoops the front even more. Hmm. Complaining about the nine key. Push that nine down all the way. It's oh, I see. Yeah, the the R twos are a little tough because in fact it's probably best to put the keys on before you actually put it in the housing because <laughs> it's not fully supported up here at the back. But wow, it does look totally taller, doesn't it? Is it just perspective, or oh, it does. On camera, you can tell it's slightly higher, like right there. Huh. That's funny. Oh, you can see the edges. Oh, it is actually visible. Yeah, well, you know, pre-production set. It's not me, guys. I put it on correctly. <laughs> <laughs> I shall mention it to Signature Plastics. This is actually a new profile and set of molds for them. Uh, it's possible oh. that the problem is actually in the mold. That's definitely not the way to do it, right? Uh, I have to switch polar. Oh, okay. yeah. oh, it came up. Okay. Is this just too tight? <laughs> I think what's happening here is that the, uh, again, it's that issue of plate alignment you're a little bit off to one corner, okay. and so it's uh, the housing is actually holding the key set down. So if you want, you can maybe hold off on putting that key on until we do the plate alignment stuff. All right, so I should loosen all four screws. The key set looks fantastic, though. Probably too loose, right? <laughs> it doesn't matter. I mean, as long as you can move it around. Sorry, um, it's this is definitely the most fiddly and difficult part of this installation, particularly uh, on the R2. Mm -hmm. So but I mean, you want it to have it like some degree of freedom of movement in all axes, but not so much that it actually falls out. Yeah. Um, so what I always do, and that this doesn't always work perfectly, is try to align it visually in a way that looks right. And then, oh, this is actually fairly common with um, gasket builds. Yeah. You have to fit a line with the plate to make sure it's properly aligned. Yeah, it's, it's understandable. And then once you got it where you want, you have to try to like cinch the plate against the housing and then flip it over. But I half the, half the time I just make it move when I flip it <laughs> over, so it's just you have to kind of redo it sometimes. What I, what I tend to do is I'll flip it over, if I'm doing it by myself, it obviously helps having a second person, <laughs> I'll flip it over, I'll try to hold it, the two, the plate and the housing together tightly, and I'll just make sure that I get one screw in really tightly, and then you can kind of relax and let go a little bit. Um, I think that's pretty good. That key popped up, so that's a good start. Nice. Hopefully this, oh, it works now. For All those right. who don't love the sound of the R2 RGB, um, but still want the uh, MX experience, there's probably some enhancements that you can do, like you could lube your sliders, and I also brought some um, some foam that you could put inside of the housing. This is a foam sold by Silverstone, you get on Amazon pretty easily, and uh, people in the last round reported success um, mm -hmm. improving the acoustics of their Norbu forces by lining the interior of the housing with it. It compresses a little bit, so. Yeah, but I mean, I'm sure my viewers are aware that the RGB wheel force is known to have is known to sound not as great sure. as the stock wheel force or even the normal R2. Something about the sliders, I don't know why, but yeah, I think yeah. it may be an unavoidable physical issue relating mm -hmm. to the geometry of the sliders, unfortunately, since that seems to be so consistent. Can maybe have aligned that better. Occasionally, on not on even on my housings, but on other housings in the past, sometimes with signature plastics keycaps, like on the Galaxy class, yeah. I occasionally had to use a, use sandpaper to slightly round the edges mm. um, because they can be a little bit um, stick yeah. out of it. All right, but that's the set. 
When do you have to leave again? Doesn't matter. Oh, okay. Do you run a time crunch? No. Um. Should we try this then? It's at your discretion. I do have a scissor. I don't have an exacto knife though. Okay. Oh, there you go. Do you want to cut this? Oh yeah, I probably won't do a very good job of it. <laughs> yeah, a good I'm way not to a do very it. good cutter as well. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Maybe one way to do it here. Let's measure. Um, just this. I mean, it doesn't really. No one will see it, so it doesn't have to be the most beautiful or elegant thing in the universe. Yeah. Uh, let me, do you know where the, the white plate is? White plate is there. Yeah. So, let's see. Oh, you're going to cut it to the plate. Sure, I'm just making sure that everything. Uh, it's not. Definitely don't want it to overhang, right? <laughs> Someone saying no one will see it. Dash 400 viewers. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we must encourage non-perfectionism. <laughs> like, I'm completely incapable of cutting a straight line, so I'm just gonna. That's why I defer to I'm gonna own it. <laughs> you know, without mechanical assistance. But rather than dig for a ruler, okay, this is, will work just fine. And I most emphatically did not cut a straight line. So I'm gonna have to shave some more off. That's fine. Um, sorry. Totally working our way in. This is a DIY screen. So this foam is actually. Oh, it has an adhesive. It does have an adhesive on. backing, yeah. Probably don't need to take that off there. This is, it's designed for acoustic dampening in computer cases. Which, oh. is, which is why Silverstone makes it. Okay. It's really like the uh, squeaky sound there. It's like something from Roger Rabbit. Okay. And then I'll just cut some more off of it. So how often do things go disastrously wrong on your stream? Does that ever happen? You like you build a keyboard and it just like totally doesn't work and you have to give up? And... Uh, not too often, but it does happen frequently, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anything that's that the most disastrous thing that's happened is probably the PCB just doesn't work. Sure. Yeah. I can totally see that. Um, and so we probably also again I haven't done this before. This. Yeah, I was gonna say. Yeah. So we probably want a notch for that. So um, this will be reversed. Probably um, fit here. Oh, we got plenty of space. Yeah, I except mean, that we want the want to, we want to flip it, it because of the adhesive layer. Right. Oh, you actually plan on sticking it in? I was just gonna leave that. Okay, yes, yeah, it's, it's fine. That's yeah. a good point. Just make it easy that way. So I'm gonna mark it. Oops. Clearly, the community of people who consume my products know more about. Make sure I'm not cutting the cable. Um, <laughs> know more about how to make them nice than I do in some ways. Yeah, I mean, once I've stuck see. tissue inside the case, like. Like Kleenex? Paper <laughs> tissue, yeah. Uh, uh, um, because did it help? Yeah, the reason being um, PCB, the pins, the switch pin sticking out the PCB were touching the bottom of the case, so shorted. Mm. So I had to put something yeah, to well. stop the shortage. And I just had tissues near me, so that's what I put in. Why not? All right, so hopefully we can just close this. Um, yeah, so you want this. the uh, the countersunk holes to be facing up, which means flipping the... Uh, okay. Also, one other thing I'll mention about this, because it is a pre-production sample, is that the holes are ever so slightly misaligned on the plate, so the mm. production units will be better. Okay. It's less than a millimeter. But... There's the countersink screws, yeah. A bunch more if you need them. Yeah, I, I dropped one over there, I couldn't find it. Someone's saying, my friend filled his board with cotton balls. <laughs> Whatever works. Would you ever consider streaming, Ryan? Um, I don't think so, no. I'm more interested in making <laughs> things. I don't know if you're aware, but Dixie streams from time to time. Yeah, uh, I know that... Um, Key Cult's also streaming. Yeah. 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 And I don't they, know. They I actually not, give I'm, their news through their streams. Yeah, well, I'm not so. interesting enough for, to stream things. I, don't think. I think you... 
don't give yourself a credit. A lot of people find you interesting. That's very generous of you. <laughs> planning on being at the NorCal meetup, right? Yes, of course. Looking forward to that. All right, yeah, it's just missing one screw, I guess. That's not too yeah. bad. Oh. So what do you do with all your pre-production run units? Do you also sell them? Do you get them refinished? Or? Uh, if it were absolutely flawless, I would probably sell it. But um, again, there's this ever so slight mm -hmm. hole alignment issue on these plates, which uh, makes me not want to sell it. Um, and um, some of the units, like I said, don't have the uh, bumper holes in the final production position, so I probably won't oh, sell them. Okay. I'm going to put them all in my new Bisley, Bisley cabinets and um, <laughs> just have an archive of old projects. Something actually really satisfying, I, I set this up a little bit right before I left, was just like opening a drawer and having 10 keyboards in it yeah. with all different finishes <laughs> and having a whole just stacked like cabinet of that. Yeah, I feel like a yeah. crazy mad scientist or anything. So. Um, do you want me to put the feet on? or? Yeah, sure. All right, let's put the feet on. Too. So it, it depends on how you're going to use it. If you are using it with the risers, I would put one here and one here, and then the ones along the front edge. Um, under these risers, if you're not using the risers, there are also two pockets here, and so you can put them on those edges, or if you want to go all out, you can actually put it all the way around the whole thing. Mm -hmm. But um, sometimes putting more on actually can create some issues if your desk isn't completely dead flat. So I like these four positions and then those two. These feet seem to be going in really nicely though. Yeah, these are custom molded, uh, injection molded urethane parts. Oh, they're like custom, okay. Yeah, yeah. They're like, <clears throat> like one of the last components that I'm still sourcing from China. Um, and I'm looking at alternatives actually. Mm. Seven that I just always use. So, uh, and then this is a cable from Space Cables. Ooh. Um, oh, you. I've actually well. been meaning to see how their cables are. Is Quite excellent. A, He's also a really nice guy. In the, com uh, the community, I think. Yeah, but he does really excellent work. Uh, I think he's a little bit swamped with, uh, you know, as, as always seems to happen with custom cable makers, is, you know, he has a huge backlog right now. We were originally yeah. going to offer cables as part of the group buy, but uh, I think he's just too backlogged right now. So. Yeah, there is a shortage of cable makers right now. There just aren't enough, especially in the States, I think. There are a couple internationally, but surprisingly, there aren't a lot of cable makers. As with most things involving physical making, most consumers don't appreciate how much work goes into actually making a cable, because yeah. it's one of these things that's become so commodified mm -hmm. because of you know cheap Chinese uh, electronics components that uh, people just assume that's an electrical, electrical <laughs> cable. It should be like a dollar, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, they can be not expensive, though. Not at all. And have, for good reason. I have Limo saying. connectors and that oh, drastically yeah. adds to the price. Well, I think this is too short for my computer, actually. Oh, okay. Sorry. So we probably can't use it. Like that. That's quite all right. But I have the cable. But here's the finished product. Yeah, so the assembly wasn't too bad. I would say it's actually easier than the Mark One, except for having to align the plate. But I'm fairly used to that now. Most of the key code keyboards any keyboard using gasket mounts nowadays, you have to do some kind of alignment. Yeah. So. And given the sticking of the escape key, we probably could have done a better job even. Yeah. Um, or as I say, you can always sand down the key a little bit. I've had to do that in the past. Step back. Probably should have done this angle too. Okay. Yeah, and the keycap set looks a lot nicer in person, I think, than in pictures. Yeah, even in the in the image there, it looks a little more saturated than in person, I think. Yeah. I feel like this is a keycap set that's going to be hard to accurately 
photograph for a lot of people. I feel like the um, the images that I have on my Instagram right now and that I recently posted to the Keep Talk thread do represent it pretty reasonably well, um, mm -hmm. only because I really sort of cranked up the exposure a fair amount. Oopoo. There we go. All right. So after every build, it is customary that we do a typing test on my stream. Fair enough, as long as you don't hit the escape key. <laughs> um, turn this on. Oh, that's not... Okay, hold on. Why is that showing? Um, turn this off real quick. Can we get the uh, Where's Per Minute bot started mods? Also, the page down is not. Oh. Uh, these were not issues I was having before. So. Bot is dead. Oh, bot is. Right, bot is not live. Hold on, hold on. streaming for two hours and 31 minutes yes well yeah. we spent like the te first te 15 minutes on the starting screen so all right bot is not alive bot's not alive bot's alive <laughs> yeah so i have a bot that parses chat cool and then records people's entries right. i think this is the first time we've ever had a guest a live guest that actually does keyboard content. So we will let you do the first typing test. Of this. Oh God, no, that's too much. <laughs> you guys are guessing for, it. actually people voted for me. So I'll do the first typing yeah, test definitely and then you can do the second one. All right. This is, uh, do you have a guess on how fast I, you think I'll type? I've guessed not dead. What? He didn't sign up for this. <laughs> yeah, so it, it parses guesses for a minute and then stops taking guesses after a while. And then I have. Oh, a, people are speculating as to what your typing speed is. Yeah, how fast I type. Yeah, that's something I do at the end of every stream. And then I keep running spreadsheet of who's guessed correctly how many times. Yeah. Alright, so people are saying a lot of 130s. So here we have the Norba Force Mark II, um, built with the Round II Real Force, um, completely stock, using the DSS After School keycap set. After School 1992. After School 1992, yeah. yes. And this is the VHS finish for the Norba Force Mark II. All right, let's see how fast you can type. Oh, wait, that's bad, that's bad. I'm making so many mistakes. <sighs> 120s. 
Wait, three. It didn't break 133. Here it is. Yeah, so I, I can input my words per minute and then it'll choose the wires who guessed it correctly. Very nice. Yeah. So we do a second one for Mr. Ryan. I've never. Because <laughs> you, you actually have a typing test on your YouTube channel as well. Do I? Oh, well, yeah, but only for sound purposes, not for yeah, speed purposes. <laughs> it'd be, it'd be I, cool um, my great weakness as a typist is uh, errors. I, uh, I spend like 50% of my time backspacing. I think that's me too. If I didn't backspace or make errors, I would jump up significantly in speed. I spent a lot of time when I was first into keyboards uh, like practicing speed, but mm -hmm. eventually I felt like I really past a certain speed. It's almost like you're typing faster than you can really think or write an email. Yeah, uh, and it hardly matters because really so to get your speed way up, you kind of have to really concentrate on not making an error. Yeah, right. So I think it's a bit of an arbitrary um, metric mm -hmm. for whatever it's worth. But I'll do it if you insist. Yeah, that'd be cool <laughs> to see. Yeah, it's uh, don't start yet because it's still accepting. Oh dear. So you guys are guessing for Ryan right now. Yes, guess low. Feel free to get comfortable. So I'm waiting for people to guess, right? Oh, uh, I already finished, yeah. Oh. It's already parsed, so. Okay. So this typing test is one that requires you to fix errors, right? Is that how it works? Uh, you don't have to fix, you can just you can just skip it. Yeah, you can skip yeah. it. Okay, but then you don't get like credit for the word. Yeah. Error. Okay. Oh, it's 10 fast fingers. I think uh -huh. I've used this one before back then. Mercy. Oh, Ren's actually pretty fast. typed in front of a crowd? No, I haven't. <laughs> I'd be very nervous. Oh, you have one single winner. Amanda GG guessed you would type 95. Yeah. Typing in front of a crowd is not as... It's a lot more nerve-wracking than it seems. <laughs> it shouldn't be, but it is. Yeah. yeah, you know, there's always this, like... It is true of speaking in public or anything. Uh -huh. that Whenever you are doing something where you know someone else is, like, evaluating what you're doing, you, just, you get in this, like, weird recursive... Yeah. train of thought where you're sort of watching yourself as you're doing what you're doing yeah. and that always creates this retarded feedback loop that <laughs> greatly diminishes one's performance. Um, Jennifer saying, OMG this keyboard is so cute and retro. Whoa, Cosner, thank you so much for the five gift to subs. Thank you. But yeah. Um, there's also another one of my like chat things is um, because I get so nervous, I'll redo the typing test and there's also a running tally of how many times I've redone the typing test. <laughs> yeah. Very good. I've done it for almost a, over a year now and I still get nervous every time I do a typing test on well, stream. Well, you know, what's wrong with that? Being nervous is endearing. Well, I mean, it's, a, it's just a typing test, but I still get nervous. <laughs> yeah. Such is life. Yeah. We're, uh, we're social animals. <laughs> but yeah, this is the Narva Force Mark II. First look at it. As far as I'm aware, right? I also have an aperture one here. Oh, right. He did bring the aperture finish as well. I didn't have matching risers, so I used black anodized ones on it. But this should give you a little bit of a sense of the, uh, sense of the finish. But also, if anyone purchased... Um, was it Photographer's Gray for the Heavy 6 that you offered this finish? Or is it different uh, from that? I think I, I originally was thinking of calling it Photographer's Grey, but I realized that Aperture was a more succinct word, and so I just switched the term to that. But it's the same finish. Yeah. Um, people really yeah. seem to like it quite a lot. In fact, I have Heavy Sixes still in stock in this finish. Mm -hmm. Heavy I Six, I should say. Um, 
the one thing about showing this finish under studio lighting is it gives the impression of it being much shinier than it actually is. Yeah. Because if the light hits you, like if you do it's it like reflects. that, it looks like it's super shiny, but it's not. It doesn't really look that way in real life. Yeah. It's mostly just that kind of gray look that you see right now. Yeah. And I know we talked about this a lot, but this this finish personally resonates a lot with me. Because I'm also a big Leica fan. <laughs> yes, yeah. a lot of people really were super into it, which is why I offered it yeah. this round because it wasn't available in the Mark yeah. One. Um, also, so the the rear cover plate on the Mark Twos comes in two versions. There's the textured black, which is what that is, and then there's the textured white. And so I've selected colors that I feel are complementary, mm -hmm. um, and I, the black clearly goes best with the aperture. But the like the VHS finish has a textured white plate. Yeah, th these black risers actually don't look all that bad either, in my opinion. Yeah, it doesn't look too bad. The uh, the factory in the pre-production samples made a slight mistake, which is they didn't make a distinction between mm -hmm. the left and right risers because they're actually not they're mirrored, but they're not the interchangeable, right? Oh. Um, and so they just kind of grabbed two and did two of each finish, not realizing that they were different. So mm. we've updated the procedures for production. Third one here as well, just so we yeah, can have. And that's the K2 finish, and this I think this is an R2, but one of the non-RGB R2s. Mm. So yeah, here we go, chat. Here we have three Norba Force Mark IIs on my table. This is the K2 finish, aperture, VHS. Y'all look nice. <laughs> thank you. It's been a yeah. long time getting here, but I'm very happy with the result. Yeah, and I mean, thank you for bringing it down for me because <laughs> Norbar obviously traveled to get here. He had my to pleasure. carry this. Yeah. People saying Aperture is my fave. Uh, when is it shipping if that's not TBD? Well, I mean, that's always to be, to be determined when it comes to manufacturing, but... Um, I mean, the group I finished closes at October 26th. Yeah, I mean, fundamentally, the promise that's been made to me by the factory is like a few months, you know, two, three months maybe, but I, I've i never, ever experienced a factory actually meeting its time commitments. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I like to be sort of uh, intentionally vague about this and say, you know, at some point in the winter, probably, you know, in the late winter. Mm -hmm. um, and as soon as I feel like we're getting closer to zeroing in on an actual timeline, I'll, of course, uh, share that and post it. But... Uh, my general philosophy is um, because I'm so I try to be as obsessive as possible about getting the quality maximal mm -hmm. um, that ships that I always uh, prefer to slip any kind of any kind of deadline and therefore not have a hard deadline rather than ship something that I don't think is good yeah. um, I'm very confident in this factory based on the pre-production samples and physically visiting there and being able to be more involved in person but you know you never know, so I try to be have a reasonably pessimistic estimate, and hopefully, uh, if anything, I'll ship beforehand. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's nice. I I mean I know your previous work, so I have a baseline, but it's hard to convey what powder coating feels like as well, because there just aren't a lot of powder coating options currently. You're you're like the go-to person when you talk about powder coating in the community. So. I really like it for the creative options it awards for sure, but I understand why, um, given my own personal experience in figuring out how to get it coming out with reasonable reject rates and good quality, I, I understand why a lot of people don't do it. Yeah. It uh, can be a perilous undertaking. <laughs> but you know, anodizing is not perfect either. It's anodizing. People have problems with anodizing in group eyes all the time. Yeah. Um, so someone asking, how do you feel about mice and do you have a preference? Currently, I'm using a Razer mouse. Um, Whoa, you use a Razer product? Yeah, I mean, what? do you know better alternatives? I would love any sort of good alternative. Um, do you like this? Yeah, I like that, that's fine. Is it's it a the Logitech? MX Master 3, it's the latest model that came out. So there's a company that makes my 3D mouse, which I use for CAD software, it's called a Space Navigator, and uh -huh. I just saw the other day that they make a mouse also. It's not a 3, uh -huh. you know, 3D mouse that allows you to manipulate an object in 3D space very mm -hmm. easily. Um, but they also have a CAD mouse, which I think is just like a, probably a slightly rebranded Logitech or something. Mm -hmm. But I might switch to that just because then I won't have a razor and I'll just have two CAD branded things, even though they probably come from the same factory. Well, I mean, I I don't hate razor mice. It's just surprising because 
I guess the doesn't look like it would fit your desk. It aesthetic. totally doesn't yeah. fit. I hate it. Just yeah. having like the green logo flash. And <laughs> That's why I like this CAD one. Um, I, I, I don't remember the name of it exactly, but uh -huh. it's from that same company, 3D Connection. Okay. Uh, and it, it just looks a little bit more industrial. It has a stainless steel base on it mm -hmm. um, and less gamery. So I might just, for, even though I have no uh, rational technical argument for making the switch, I might just do it anyway. Okay. What is that? Um, someone asking for a sound demo between the round two RGB and non RGB. Oh yeah, we could do that. Well, it's not really a fair comparison because they're using different keycaps. We should um as well as let me just this has been dampened. Verify that this is actually an R two. Is there a way to? Oh yeah, we can tell by the, uh, no, by the keycaps. Yeah. So this is an R two. Yeah. yeah. So it should be pretty perceptible the sound difference actually. Well, I'm I'm saying it's not a fair comparison. It's not a fair comparison, yeah. but it'll still be. It'll be all the more uh, perceptible as a result of that. So this is... Yeah, there's definitely a sound difference. And this isn't lined with anything, right? That one is not lined. Yeah. That's right. And it's, it's not lubricated or anything. It's yeah. just stock. So both are stock, but this has a shelf liner in here and different keycaps and keyboard. Yeah, I think with some amount of lubricating, you could improve the sound on that, but it's never, it's not gonna sound exactly like that. Yeah. So it's a question of what aesthetic options you want, really. Uh, these are both 45 grams. Yeah. And those are ABS and that's PBT, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and I think probably the DSS Molds are thinner walled. Yeah, it's definitely like thin. Yeah. Thinner than GMK at least. That's probably what people are used to. People are saying the bottom one sounds nicer. I don't um, disagree with that. Yeah, probably they did a thicker. I mean, so I, I think stock Toto keycaps are actually really nice. I agree. Yeah. This is pretty thick PBT, uh, pretty thin ABS. Um, have you tried 55 gram Topa? Uh, yeah, I don't use it, but I've tried it. You like 45 gram better? I like 30. Is this 30? <laughs> That's just the stock one. But okay. I, I've dome swapped my uh -huh. um, my daily driver 87U with 30 grams from a JIS layout. Okay. Like weird limited edition one I got a long time ago. Mm. I really do like quite light actuation force. Yeah. That's my thing. Well, that is all I have prepared. Does ch chat have any final questions? Not necessary. R2 is factory silenced. It's much quieter in the real world. Is the R2 factory silenced, all of them? Does it come with uh, signs? I mean, silencing reasons? Oh, I'm actually not sure. This does not sound silenced to me though. Uh, it might be actually, I'm not sure. Uh, will you both be at NorCal again? Yes, I will be traveling for, I have to travel now for the NorCal meetup. <laughs> and I will certainly be there. I'm uh, driving back the next day here to SoCal, but I'll be there. Oh, why? Um, I'm spending a week in Disneyland with my brother and his family. Oh, you're coming again for the- <laughs> We meet again, this is like I basically live here. <laughs> Um, in remote office. Would love an astrophysical purple heavy six, someone says. Well, I mean, you could always uh, you could always buy one and get it refinished. Uh, any, pa powder, any powder coating shop can take a powder coated part and strip it chemically and uh, refinish it, which is one of the reasons I like powder coating over anodizing, is you can actually refinish the part many, many times without damaging it. So you would just sandblast it and then do a refinishing? Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, that's technically possible in some cases if you're careful about it and haven't done it multiple times with anodizing, but it's, uh, it's much trickier. Uh, and oftentimes, the if you're trying to address an anodizing issue, it's mm -hmm. usually the issue is in the, the aluminum itself, mm -hmm. and uh, you're just like you're taking off one layer and then just simply exposing more aluminum that has the same issue. Um, uh, I've, yeah, I've been through that process many times. At any rate, to answer the question, I probably won't be doing any more heavy sixes. So, uh, simply because the availability of the FC660C is quite limited, um, and therefore, 
probably doesn't make sense to do another big batch of them. So uh, I do have a few left in my store, but those will very likely be the last ones. So if you desperately wanted one in purple, I think the best solution would probably be to buy it and strip it and get somebody to do it. You can always email me and I can get you the color code so you can um, obtain the same finish uh, from the company that makes the powder coat. Happy to do that. Does the quality of the aluminum affect powder coating? Uh, anodizing, yes, absolutely. Yeah, I know, powder yeah. coating, less so. Okay, yeah. And I'm guessing the different grades also, they, they can all survive the baking process. Yeah, it's, it's really, I mean, powder coating is, in, in that respect is a pretty forgiving process mm -hmm. in terms of the actual underlying parts. Okay. The surface finish can be fiddly. Someone asked if Venice Beach colorway got retired. Uh, no, I'll probably almost certainly bring that back uh, on another round. It was just a question of like it, figuring out what would make the cut uh, on this board. And I felt like I was trying to find something that would match this set pretty well. Um, and I felt like the Venice Beach would have been a little bit much on that one. That's uh, the purple one? Uh, Venice Beach, I'm sorry, is a uh, it's color it's not unlike that. It's kind of like a hot pink. I've seen that. Okay, you have laser yeah. on yours. At home. That's right. Yeah, okay. it goes really well with GMK laser, yeah. but so does the astrophysical purple. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of was trying to pick. I really love the laser key set, and so yeah. I was trying to pick which one um, I should offer. Mm -hmm. And simply, a lot of people actually explicitly asked me for the purple again. So I, yeah. I did it. I've seen that. I've typed on that keyboard. <laughs> Uh, which is your favorite color offering for the Mark II? Ooh. Well, I, I like the Veracity Steel, but I don't know. I, it would either have to be the Aperture Finish or the Retro Refrigerator for me. I don't know if you have a favorite, but. <laughs> Someone asked if we got our glasses at the same store. <laughs> uh, which I got, definitely not. I got mine from Jin's glasses. Jin's glasses? I In San Francisco. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> mine came from a, a German company that has a shop in Los Angeles called Mikita. Never heard. They're really interesting, actually. I like them. It's an industrial designer. I don't know if, you, if there's any way you can see it. But the, uh, probably not, but it's, uh, it's like folded sheet metal. Um, so there's no hinge that's separate from the inherent sheet metal that is the glasses itself and so it has this like oh. snapping mechanism Whoa. <laughs> um, and the the frames are titanium so it'll probably actually it's very very light and very flexible but there's no screw to lose and uh losing screws from my glasses has been a you've lost screws on your glasses oh yeah my old glasses which were also very nerdy in german uh, and that i liked quite a lot um eventually um broke down for various reasons but one of them was the screw kept always coming out <laughs> oh I just realized those are like the iconic Norbauer glasses too. It's on <laughs> all your true. profile pictures. Yeah, so those were made by a German company called Lunor, which is very sort of fussy and hand makes everything. And I've uh -huh. loved them for a really long time um, because they're just like, they're, they exactly replicate a style of glasses that were used in the, the 19th century a lot. Um, but, and they don't have, they didn't have nose pads, mm -hmm. which creates a really interesting look. But for whatever reason, that company Lunar just stopped making them. Um, uh, just that particular model? That or just particular series of models, yeah. Um, and I can't find them anymore, and I'm really sad about it. So I switched to these. <laughs> but what can you do? Yeah, uh, they're, they're, they're sufficiently nerdy that they get, give the same vibe, accurately portraying my personality. A lot of laughs. Uh, the other half of Key Cult saying, he hopes you can bring them to NorCal. Oh, you're going to be at NorCal a lot of laughs. Okay, cool. Right. Elaborate on the tactical black anno process. Sure. So uh, it is hard anodizing, uh, so type three rather than type two, um, and therefore the oxide layer is considerably thicker and it is more resistant to showing scratches. Uh, the, the name hard anodizing, from what I understand, is actually slightly a um, bit of a misnomer. It's not necessarily inherently a lot harder. Uh, it's just that if you do impart scratches to it the layer is much thicker and so the scratches don't become visible because they don't penetrate through to the lower layer. It is a little bit harder but not like radically so as if it were an entirely different material. Um, and uh, it's done here in the US and the samples I got were quite good. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, one thing that I learned from the last time around which is that you can, uh, sorry by last time around I mean on the heavy six and the monolith, is that uh, one way of deepening the black of uh, 
uh, a coating layer on top of metal is you can uh, actually wax it with Carnova wax, which is like used, it's a natural wax that's used on cars. And uh, I actually did a little bit of experimenting with that and that creates interesting results. You can totally do it with the, that tactical finish if you're into it. Like it, it creates a different sort of, it, it creates a different relationship with your fingerprints. And I think in some ways uh, it makes fingerprints less visible, especially mm -hmm. if you don't put too much on um, because it creates, it, it basically pre-fingerprints the entire surface of your keyboard rather than slowly letting the little parts get covered yeah. in oil, you know? Because uh, effectively, your fingerprints are doing the same thing. They're, they're darkening the surface of yeah. the black by giving it uh, uh, effectively a more glossy surface, right? And so uh, waxing is an option. I won't include wax because I'm not like necessarily representing this as a thing you should do. Uh, and it doesn't come stock on it like it did on the monolith. But um, it's an option. It's kind of like a fun thing to play with. But I think I've now exhausted all the thoughts I have to offer on the tactical finish. <laughs> if you yeah, have I'll a specific make, question, I'm happy to answer it. I also made a cool video on it too, right? I'd wax the monolith. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, if you say it's cool, I'll defer to you, but I did make a video about it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Well, it looks like chat doesn't have too many more questions. Before we end, could I, I wanted to get a screenshot of each of us holding a Mark II. Sure. So all you have to do is you can hold on to this. All right. And I'll hold on to this. And we'll just stay still for a couple seconds. So I can use this as my YouTube screenshot. All right. Just smile for like three seconds. <laughs> I'm good at smiling. All right. <laughs> That's good. Say hello to YouTube chat. That's funny. Yeah. All right. I think that is it for today's stream then. Yeah, we're about to hit the three hour mark, so. Thank you for enduring this long period of my blabbering. No, I think a lot of people actually found it very informative. I don't uh, usually talk. Of yeah. <laughs> you don't usually talk? I don't usually go super in depth about technical stuff. Oh, okay. Um, just because I have a lot of newcomers joining in every time. Okay. So they usually ask the basic questions of like, where do I get this? Where do I get that? So it's, yeah, it's nice to have, especially also someone more knowledgeable than I am in some of the nitty gritty stuff. Cool. Well, one thing I'll add is, if, sorry, if anyone is interested in any of those forthcoming projects I talked about, you can join my email list. It's norbauer.com oh, slash yes. list. Plug all um, your stuff here. Well, I mean, I don't need to plug anything. It's just, it's a good way to stay in touch because <laughs> uh -huh. I'm, as I say, I kind of work pretty intermittently on these projects. I'll just go disappear for a few months, work on a project, and then I'll be like, okay, it's ready. And then uh, it'll tend to be announced and then people will often find out about it like way after it's available. And then I'm trying to like, address that. So one good way to stay in touch is just like be on my email, email list, which is yeah. norbauer.com slash list. And your website is shop.norbauer.com? It is at the moment. Yeah, I'm currently redoing my website. Right. So it will be just like norbauer.com soon, okay. uh, but not yet. All right. Um, so what we do at the end of every stream is um, what you do on Twitch is after your stream is over, you can choose to raid another stream, which is which is me. I'm essentially sending my viewers to someone else's stream. Interesting. Okay. So they can continue watching someone else. That's kind of how exposure works on Twitch. So Got it. I'm just going to check who's live and then we can go give them a raid. Uh, I don't know if you know any streamers. But <laughs> the only person I know is Preston. He is not streaming right now. We can go raid. And uh, of course, um, Tiny. Tiny is also not live. We can go raid uh, Mitsu. She is someone, a friend of mine. Wait, raid Minter? Is Minterly live? Uh, do I follow Minterly? I oh, I don't follow Minterly. Hold on. Okay, let me shoot her a follow. Wait. How do I go to my stream? Uh, cancel, cancel, cancel. All right, we're gonna go raid Minterly. Do you know Minterly? I don't. She she's based in NorCal, I believe. Really? Yeah. Does she stream she, about keyboards? I think she started streaming recently, but okay. she ran SA Bliss. I don't oh, know if you're okay. aware of that keycap. I've seen it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. She's a designer for it. Excellent. She'll be at the NorCal meetup. Yeah, I think so. She's local, so 
All right, thank you everyone for stopping by today. I will see you guys. Um, I might stream this weekend, we'll see. But yeah, I don't have a set schedule for now, so bear with me until I get that figured out. But hopefully you guys enjoyed today's stream and the guest, of course. So until next time, see you nerds.